Well, good morning, uh, councillors and those in the room. Sorry for the uh, slight delay, but um, I'd like to welcome you all to the Environment Community Committee meeting of the Toowoomba Regional Council. So this meeting is open to the public and also be live streamed. And I'd like to thank those of you in the room with us today and acknowledge everyone watching via Council's social media channels. I'd like to acknowledge the CEO, Mr Brian Pigeon, General Manager, Environment Community, Nick Houser, Mayor, Paul Antonio, Deputy Mayor, McDonald, Councillors, and also a portfolio lead of the Environment Community Portfolio, Councillor Tim McMahon. Uh, Councillors, as we said, this is a, uh, our committee meeting for the month of, uh, of March, and I would like to uh, just to open uh, just for a couple of quick remarks around, as chair, I encourage open, passionate and frank discussion, but ask that it's done in a respectful manner if we can go hard on the issue and soft on, on people. I would also like to uh, pay tribute and acknowledge a couple of things this week. We had obviously International Women's Day earlier in the week, so a very significant date, and also acknowledge as well that we are in Parks Week. So to uh, Councillor McMahon, Chair of the, the Parks area of the portfolio, obviously a, a big week and, and we celebrate the parks that we have right across our region and a week where we encourage residents to enjoy the neighbourhood parks, open spaces that we do have. So I encourage you to get out and do that. A couple of notes on that that I would like to quickly mention. So if you want to talk about our top five list to spend time in our parks, if you haven't done any of these, give them a go during this week. So you can join one of our regular change project activities. So all of these, of course, is available as well via the change project webpage. So jump on there and have a look. A variety of activities that, that can be done there as well. Or you might like to go for uh, a hike. So you can uh, take advice from our walks and trails booklet for that one as well. Uh, one that we're all very uh, popular with. You can uh, take your fairy friends to many of our off-leash parks. So that's another of the uh, great ways to spend time in our parks. Or you can grab a picnic blanket. So just enjoy what we have, and lastly but not leastly, volunteer at one of our bush care and gardening groups. So all of these different activities and so many more of those are being acknowledged during Parks Week. So we do encourage you to take part in that. A couple of events this weekend, the 13th of March is Highfields Falls Open Day, and on the 14th Sunday we have Bike with Toowoomba here in the city. But again, if you jump onto Council's website and have a look at that, even if you Google Parks Week, it'll come up that way. Have a look at our events register. There's plenty of activities that are occurring there to acknowledge Parks Week. I would also like to uh, acknowledge the Aboriginal parties whose songlines traverse the lands that we meet on today, the Western Waka Waka, Gaibal and Jarawa peoples, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the knowledge, rich traditions and bold ambitions of Australia's first people. Item two, councillors, is uh, attendance, so including apologies, leave of absence and declarations of, of conflicts. Do we have any uh, leave of absence? requests. Okay, so we'll go to the declarations. I uh, personally have a, a declaration here, so a declaration of prescribed conflict of interest. Item number three, community grant program sports tourism event grant program appro approval February 2021. I'd like to inform this meeting that I have a prescribed conflict of interest in this matter as defined in section 150 EI of the Local Government Act 2009. The nature of my interest is as follows. A, the applicant is Brothers Toowoomba Rugby League Football Club. Uh, Brothers Toowoomba Rugby League Football Club is the principal tenant and major shareholder of the Glenhome Park Sports and Community Hub Incorporated. And I'm a director on the board for this Glenhome Park Sports and Community Hub Incorporated. So in accordance with section 150 EM of the Local Government Act 2009, I will leave the meeting and stay away from the meeting while this matter is discussed and voted on. And then Mr Chair, uh, if I like, I also declare similarly that I am the honorary patron of the Brothers Rugby League Club and I think in the past uh, it's been okay for me to remain in the room, but I'm quite happy to accept the judgment of my colleagues. Okay, so is there any, I suppose I open that to, to the floor, does anyone have any questions or concerns around uh, Councillor Antonio's participation. So you're saying you, you're comfortable to participate in it with well, permission of? Well, I have in of... the past. Yep. Uh, and uh, I am the honorary patron. Uh, Councillor Von Hoff. Um, thank you. Through you, Mr Chair, to the CEO. Correct me if I'm wrong, CEO, but being patron of an organisation does not prohibit you from participating in the debate and the vote. Is that correct? Okay, so unless there are any further objections... Uh, to that? No? So, Mayor, you're comfortable to remain... Oh, sorry, Councillor Shine. Uh, no, not objecting to... 
But uh, just uh, I just mentioned that in relation to that club, I um, purchased a uh, life membership in about 1978, I think, and uh, I don't think I've been back to watch a game of rugby league at, at all, at all whites or brothers since then. But uh... so you missed the '85 grand final, I take it. So so no conflict. To... Comfortable there. No other further on, on that one. Uh, so, Councillor Carl, on a separate. Separate. Oh. Yeah, on a sep on a yeah on a separate oh. conflict. Apologies. Thanks, Chair. Um, I wish to inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter, as defined on Section 150 EN of the Local Government Act 2009. The nature of my interest is as follows: This declarable conflict of interest arises because a person related to me is nominated to be appointed as the Aboriginal Party representative on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Committee. I propose to le leave and stay away from the place where the meeting is being held while this matter is being discussed and voted on. Further, I wish to decline the nomination uh, as a council member on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Committee. Okay. So we come back to that. So there are no further Conflicts. Okay, so councillors, we go to item three. So I've obviously made my declaration of the prescribed conflict of interest in relation to this. So I'll leave the chair and I'll ask uh, Councillor McMahon to assume the role. Thanks, Councillor O'Shea, and thanks for your uh, plug of Parks Week. Much appreciated. We move to item three, Community Grant Program Sports Tourism Event Grant Program Approval for February 2021. I'll hand over to General Manager Nick Hauser. Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, Councillors. Councillors, just a very brief overview from me. I'm, I'm sure that you're familiar with the process of the Sports Tourism Events Grants. They are open at any time while funds remain available. We receive applications. We have received one application in the period which is outlined for you and it's for the conduct of the Toowoomba uh, Rugby League Tom Gorman Pre-Season Challenge. The assessment panel has met in accordance with the program guidelines. That assessment panel consisted of uh, councillors and uh, one council officer. Uh, if there are any questions in relation to the recommendation to approve that application, the panel members would be best placed to answer those questions. But uh, uh, if there are no questions, I commend that recommendation to you. Thanks, Nick. Councillor MacDonald. Uh, not, not, <coughs> not really a question. I'm happy to move, move the recommendation, but just um, highlight uh, the importance of, um, of us fostering um, both um, female and male rugby league and this carnival will do that, which I think is a good step forward. May in fact be the first time we've done that uh, for rugby league, so I think that's a good step forward. I'm happy to move it as it is. Councillor Summerfield. Happy to step in. Councillor Carroll, did you have a question? No, I was wanting to second it. It's okay. Right. Thank you. Moved Mr. by Councillor McDonald, seconded by Councillor Summerfield. Is there any reason to go into debate? All those in favour of the motion. The motion is passed <coughs> unanimously. I'll hand over to uh, Councillor O'Shea if he could be invited back into the room to assume chair. Thank you. Thank you to Councillor McMahon. We go to item four on our agenda. So request for sponsorship for the Toowoomba Languages and Cultural Festival. I might hand over to GM Nick to introduce this one. Thank you, Councillor O'Shea. Councillors, the Toowoomba Languages and Cultures, Cultural, Cultures Festival um, has a long and proud history and successful history here in um, Toowoomba. The council has been a major part of the delivery of that, uh, that festival um, since its inception in 2006. 
uh, recently our support has evolved to be a sponsorship and we had funding set aside to sponsor that event in August of last year. Unfortunately, with all things being COVID, the event had to be cancelled. Uh, we re-baselined our budgets and um, the funding was taken um, away from the program at that point in time um, for future consideration should the event uh, be operational again. We find ourselves exactly in that situation now where the festival's planned to go ahead and a sponsorship application's been made. Sponsorship application's been assessed in accordance with the policy. There's a recommendation there to approve the sponsorship. It does require council's consideration because the rest, the, the request is for in excess of $10,000, which requires council's consideration. So hence the reason that it's here for you um, today. And there's also a request for funding to be reflected at the budget review. And I'm sure we'll have an opportunity when we work through budget, the February budget review to consider uh, budget movements. We've identified potential funding source in uh, the report from within the branch, um, acknowledging that currently our grant applications for round one were undersubscribed and uh, still appear to be trending that way, although um, applications only closed on the 1st of March for the current round. So we'll know more as we work through that. Um, however, um, budget review gives us the perfect opportunity to consider that. So councillors, the recommendation is to approve the sponsorship and address the, the funding situation at budget review. Uh, the team is here to answer any questions that you have around the event itself, if there are any. Um, but I think that uh, we're all familiar with the event and how, how important it is for our community. Thanks, Nick. So yes, we do have uh, Roberto and Daryl here as well to answer any questions. I think it's also Daryl's birthday today. Is that right? The way it looked, it must be. So happy birthday, Mr. Bates. Uh, Councillor Sean. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Chair, and uh, happy birthday, uh, Roberto. <laughs> the, uh, I note that the application was for uh, 35,000, uh, but the amount recommended is 28,000, but without, I couldn't find reasons why why it was 28, not 35. So perhaps could you enlighten us on that, please? Thanks, councillors. Good morning. Um, when we looked at the original application, had they were after more, but with some COVID restriction, COVID support within that as well to run that event. When we when we unpacked all that, um, the numbers they were looking at at that stage too. You'll see in the report they were at, at the time of the application were around 5,000. We anticipated they probably wouldn't get to the numbers they've had in the past between that 12 and 13. So we thought that 28, given we gave 25 in the past, there's some scope in there for them to support the event for this year with some money in there around the COVID restrictions and the things they might need within it. Comfortable with that. Uh, Councillor uh, McMahon. Oh, thanks, Chair. Look, um, I think this is a tremendous, in this tremendous initiative um, I'm happy to move the motion. I know there might be some more questions, but um, I wouldn't mind if my friend Roberto could give a speech because I'm quite partial to them, but maybe we don't need it and I'm happy to move. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so I do have a mover. Just, I'll, just do I have a, you're you willing to second that? I'll second and also uh, just ask the question. Is there other yeah, well, I'll just, if you Sorry, sorry, Mr Mayor. If I, I'll take the mover and the seconder, so I'll, I'll park that. Well, I've, got, I've just got a couple other questions. I'll, you, we'll, get a, we'll come back to you, I promise. I won't miss you. Uh, Councillor Harris Sullivan. Sorry, <laughs> back in that chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the the fact that it's moving from August to May is that um, is there a reason for that, or is that a better time? I'm I miss that cold, windy weather in August. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was it was an interesting one. We've had um, two or three conversations, not just us, but I know. Um, Tim through Giddy has talked to the carnival team as well around, you know, could it be attached around September? What other dates could they have? They had a dream run well, well, since 2006, mm. and it was over the last three, mm. four years, we've had it's the tough. wind and those mm. ones in it and, it, and they're trialling it. They're going for May, hoping that fits, and it also fits in, um, in that event calendar as an opportunity. Um, and yeah, they, I think they're really committed to it. And it was, it was one, um, they, moving it they took really hard decision to see if it was because it sort of entrenched that first weekend in august so yeah it's try it's a i shouldn't say it's a trial for this year but it's a movement based on weather mm -hmm. Can I follow up, Mr. Jack? Yep. um i'm not sure whether it was in that report daryl or whether it was some other report where there was um the calculation on of, of what um benefit it brings to the region was it in that report i haven't got it here but i know part of it, mm -hmm. it 
it is the economic the economic benefit it does bring in, and yeah. it's it's huge in terms of that. But also, I suppose what what the panel in the assessment that we liked about the event was that cultural showcase of the community, and 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 that's why in recommending it to council was definitely around that showcase, you know, through our a new and emerging community. But I can I can get that figure if it's not yeah, there, I'd councillor. I'd be interested to know. I mean, yeah, yep. I, I agree. It's a fantastic um, showcase. No of problem. The community. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hara Sullivan. Councillor Summerfield. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and happy birthday. <laughs> um, I'd just like to talk about the um, sponsorship of events. Uh, and Jeff MacDonald will remember this, the, the discussions that we had around this was that these events were to be go into a weaning process so that they learnt to stand more on their own so that we could then um, provide sponsorship to other events which would increase the economic development more broadly across our region. So due to COVID, even though it was $25,000 last year, due to the COVID upset, I'm comfortable with it being 28 this year, but I think the organisations or the organisers need to re understand that this should be a weaning process. We've done it with other events and that that's probably what should occur into the future. Uh, so I'm quite comfortable with the 28 this time. However, I do believe that the wording of the resolution should reflect, um, provided it is um, accepted at budget review, because at this stage, that the wording there is dictating that it will be, and I don't think that's the correct process, is it? It's March. Through you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Councillor Summerfield. In this instance, I think it is correct for us to ask for the funding to be approved if we wait until the budget mm. review process to be confirmed. Um, it will probably be April and um, it will be too late for us to sign up to that sponsorship arrangement and we would miss many of the benefits associated with it. So part of, the funding isn't available now. Part of the council decision needs to be to commit the funding and um, address that at the budget review. Comfortable with that, Councillor Summerfield? Response? Well, I guess we can be comfortable in this instance, but you know, we, we've got to make sure it doesn't become a habit because it's not the correct process that Council should follow with its budgets. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I, th I understand what you're saying, Councillor Summerfield, and, and I certainly don't disagree with you. I think this is probably a bit of a special circumstance in that the funding was available in our budget at the original budget adoption, perhaps a, a slightly different circumstance, and was removed at a previous budget review on the understanding that the event may not go ahead. Um, so perhaps there's a slight, um, a slight difference for the, the, these particular circumstances. I understand what you're saying. And ordinarily, uh, where time permits us, we would ask for council to give consideration at a budget review or at the formulation of a future budget which doesn't commit us um, um, to the funding or to the event. Um, sometimes, though, we find ourselves um, in an issue where the, the timing doesn't allow that to happen. This is one of those, and, and, I, and I guess I would suggest that our previous commitment to an original budget probably um, uh, lends itself to the argument as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carroll Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Look, this is an iconic event, and having been there on the ground from when it first started from a trailer down in Frogs Hollow uh, to what we have now, I think uh, we should be very proud of it. It actually is iconic in our community and it's only iconic because all of the different cultures we have here embrace it, pull together and, and uh, have, a, have the joy of showing off their culture. I don't believe that this should ever be expected to fund itself and I think it should also always will need to have some funding from council. We've got refugees that are continuing to come here, need to be supported, and this is one way where our community can come together, they can share their culture and actually be proud and have some joy out of it. Um, and our, our community more understands what's, what, um, you know, they understand each other through dance and performance, which I think is really important. So that's my view on this, and I think it'll always need some. But my question is that, I see in the application where, uh, and I know it didn't go ahead last year, where the 10,000 that we've cut out, or seemingly you could say that, uh, is there for the extra COVID um, uh, conditions that they have to meet to keep things um, safe, I suppose. 
Do we know how many are going to go there? Are they going to cap it? And should we get more than we expect? How then are they going to afford? Because I, I am aware that it's, well, we know it's run by volunteers. We know that there's a lot of work in it for those volunteers, and I am very aware over the last years that uh, there has been talk about it being too much, and if they don't get more support, that it may not go ahead. So COVID has come in and, um, and you know, uh, uh, um, spoiled everyone's plans for everything. But um, I'm just wondering if by cutting that back, are we making them compromise on how they um, comply with the COVID uh, uh, regulation and, and the cleaning and, and whatever else that they have to do? Because that's actually, that's 10,000 that was applied for for COVID um, compliance, if you like. So are we concerned about that? Thanks. Yep. Through you, Mr Chair. Thank yep. you. Daryl, did you want to? Yeah. Thanks, Councillor. Um, when we looking at the full application and, uh, of what they provided, they did have the $10,000 they, they wanted around the, around the planning around the COVID. But I suppose that was based at when they put that application in too, that uh, the maximum they could get was 5,000 people at that time. Oh. And so times, of, times are changing all the time around it. So based on the Queensland Health Directives just looked at now, they could be up to in the space they have, and it's dictated by the space and size uh, that they have at the outdoor venue, they could go up to around 10,000 people now. Yeah, okay. So it's a hard one to make a call. Yeah. At the assessment panel level, we believed that it, that it's not until May that with the progression we're having and, and the people they're looking at and the planning they do and the spacing they have, that oh, that would still be adequate well. for yeah. them to be able to provide that around it. And we're one of a few sponsors within that program yeah. as well. Yeah, thank you very much because, I mean, vaccination too may start to have a little bit of a... Uh, uh, thank you very much. I'll go to... Next, I've got Mayor Antonio who had a question, but also, Mayor, you probably in position to comment. We had, obviously, the organisers came in to, to meet to talk about it and they spoke around many of those aspects of numbers and how they would, what they were faced with in terms yeah, of... Yeah, look, I, I think uh, most things that have been said prior to me speaking here are, are probably I agree with, and particularly Councillor Taylor's uh, important uh, statement that it's, it's in a very iconic event. It's worthy of preservation. It tells a story about uh, the Toowoomba region and our involvement in uh, multicultural <coughs> matters. And uh, I would expect that uh, we would hopefully see this event continue in the years ahead. Uh, people like uh, Sterling Hinchcliffe, who in his previous role was uh, uh, involved in this, uh, is waxes lyrical every time I see him about that event in Toowoomba. But look, I think it's, uh, it's well run, it tells a good story, um, and I, uh, I know that a lot of work is going into it as a result of the discussion that we had with those people, and you might like to expand a little on that. But uh, you know, I'm pretty proud that we have this event, and I think it's uh, it's worthy of our support. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councillor McDonnell. Thanks, <coughs> Councillor O'Shea. Just picking up from um, Councillor Summerfield, and and uh, I agree that we've discussed the, if you like, <coughs> weaning off of of, uh, of some events. Um, that was more in regard to grants, grants rather than sponsorship. This is actually a different. Sphere sponsorship because sponsorships are around what benefit there will be to council through an agreement between the both parties. So the grant certainly was uh, a comment around events and uh, and reducing that over time to uh, to encourage the events to be self-sufficient. So I agree that that was the case, but also agree with uh, Councillor Taylor and, and obviously the mayor in regard to the iconic nature of this event and that um, sponsorships should be reviewed annually and and given what. Uh, benefit there may be to the community. It might be that there's a, a specific act or someone that comes to, to the region that would bring more people or whatever the case is. So it needs to be a, a, an annual review. The, the question that Councillor O'Hara Sullivan raised um, in regard to the economic benefit, it is mentioned in the report on page four of six around the community benefit, which I guess could be extrapolated whichever way you look at it. But their report, which was uh, which was taken from the TIMS report, uh, Toowoomba International Multicultural Society highlighted that an estimated social investment of the community <coughs> groups involved in the Language and Cultural Festival is $1.8 million, with community members as volunteers giving hundreds of hours each year. Since 2012, between 16,000 and 20,000 people 
have attended the event each year. So, I mean, that, that speaks for itself, speaks volumes of the event. Uh, no one disagrees with it. I think the, the, the story was around the amount and uh, from what the officers have given, and we've already got a motion on the books. Um, happy for it to go to vote. Mm. Thanks, Councillor Macdonald. If there are any other, no further questions or, or comments, I do have uh, m the motion there is before you, Councillors, that Council approve sponsorship to Toowoomba International Multicultural Society Incorporated in the amount of 28000 for the conduct of the Toowoomba Languages and Cultural Festival 2021 and that funding for this sponsorship be reflected at budget review. Moved by Councillor McMahon, seconded by Mayor Antonio. Is there anyone wishing to go into debate? I put the, the motion. Those in favour? It's carried unanimously. Thanks, Roberto. Thanks, Daryl. Councillors, we go to item five of our agenda, so the Milmerran pool refurbishment. We've got Manager of Property Services, Kent Stroud, on board with us here, but I'll hand over uh, once again to, to General Manager Nick Houser. Thank you, Mr Chair. Councillors, I'm just going to give a very brief intro to this one because um, Mr Stroud would like to um, give you an overview of the report and the work that we've done since our information session uh, briefing. So we did uh, run through the various options here. We've undertaken community consultation in relation to preferred um, option and, um, and the outcome of that uh, consultation was quite clear in the community's preference for a 50 metre pool. Um, We've had the opportunity to, to do some uh, works around whole of life cycle costs, understanding what they might be between uh, various options for the provision um, of the pool at Milmerran. And with that, I might just hand over to uh, Mr Stroud. I know that he's well prepared and is busting to get up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Good morning, councillors. Good morning, Ken. Uh, so I present the refurbishment report for the Milmerran pool. Uh, it's been quite a journey. Um, a few reports to council, an information session, but I think decisions like this, they certainly um, deserve that time to be considered. They have an um, impact on council's future capital works program and they have a huge impact on the communities when they're valuable community assets such as this. Look, the recommendation today acknowledges input from the Milmeran community. Uh, we did a very comprehensive consultation process. It acknowledges uh, input from councillors around this uh, room today and uh, certainly a number of council officers have contributed to um, landing where we are. Look, the report also explores not just the upfront capital expense to council, but it explores the uh, life cycle costing of operational costs for the pool, because as we all know, we uh, dig the dirt to rebuild this asset today and it uh, is potentially there servicing our community for the next 50 years. So there are a number of um, uh, uh, data and comparative data and research that's been done to present the information today and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, the information presented is a, is a full account of all the discussions that have been considered by all the stakeholders and it's a very fair and unbiased view in terms of um, what's been presented to you today. So um, I, I um, present to you the report. Thanks Mr Stroud. Questions? Councillor O'Hara Sullivan. Thanks Mr Chair. Um, Kent, thank you for the report. And look, I know um, if I was living in Milmerran and I was uh, going to the pool every day and someone said, do you want this pool replaced? I would say, yep, absolutely. What I worry about, I, you know, it's $6 million. We're, we're increasing it from a six lane pool to an eight lane pool, the equivalent of the Olympic pool mm -hmm. in the valley in Brisbane. Um, if you were to build a pool in a, in a greenfield site now, in an emerging community, would you build a 50 metre pool? Like, what I want to know is, what's the, the accepted wisdom or the theory around how people use pools? You know, these people who are using it perhaps might be in a certain age bracket, they use it for whatever they've used it for in the past. But are the people that are coming through, would they prefer to use you know, more play equipment for younger children or, you know, they don't, don't necessarily want to do laps. You know, did we consider any of that sort of thing, the, the science or the theory around what, how communities use pools? Not existing, but what, what will happen into the future, I guess. I know you can't predict the future, but what, you know, around that sort of, that, that theory or accepted wisdom. Thanks for the you question. Know what I'm asking? Good, Sorry. yes, good question, Councillor Megan. Yeah. Um, look, the, the consultation process 
did provide opportunities for the broader community, not just the Milmerran community, to have a say. Um, you know, when you dig into some of that data, um, there, there was the opportunity for people to provide input onto not just the, the current use, but the future use. And um, as, as some of the statistics in the uh, survey support, you know, 65% uh, or so of, of the community wanted and were very vocal around keeping the 50 metre pool. Um, that's not to say we didn't provide other options for people to consider. Um, look, predicting the future use of community assets is a tough one. Um, you know, your example around if we were greenfield planning a um, community like Toowoomba, you know, um, would we have a 50 metre pool? Um, I'd argue would we have nine pools? Um, but we're not. We're actually dealing with a community assets that's been in a community for 50 years. We've got a very strong and vocal community group there who um, are very uh, close to that asset um, and it's, um, they use it primarily for the lap swimming. But we certainly think in, in regards to um, the proposal going forward that we could make it as user friendly as possible for as many user groups as possible, um, which um, uh, is part of the um, increased prices. It's not just a like for like. There are some improvements we would like to make that would open up that uh, usability and utilisation for, for more users than just 50 metre lap swimmers. I hope that's answered your question. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Shine. Yeah, no, no, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. I was, uh, I was wondering why it's uh, what the justification for increasing it to eight is and whether it makes much difference in terms of cost anyway. Um, my own view is, and I've had the benefit of Councillor uh, McDonald recently of swimming in that pool with the uh, water aerobics group, uh, and uh, it certainly convinced me uh, that uh, in a country town of that nature and post amalgamation, that it would be wrong to take away something that's already mm been there in existence. Uh, it's one thing about having to justify um, capital expenditure of a new nature into an area. It's quite another thing to take away from uh, an area of that nature, something that's been there for decades. So uh, I'm certainly supportive of it. But I do query, uh, just like an explanation as to the uh, extra cost, if any, of the eight lane. And secondly, I raised uh, at a, uh, another meeting that we had here uh, at my view, and I think Council McDonald's view, that the uh, men's dressing shed, although open air in a sense that may not have had a roof on it, uh, but it was in first class condition in terms of cleanliness and presentation, I think the answer was that um, it didn't necessarily comply with today's disability regulations and that type of thing. But I was just wondering whether that could be complied with without having to demolish the lot and start again. Through you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Shine. I'll answer your uh, second part of the question first. Um, look, our analysis of the site uh, amenities, including the toilet blocks and the kiosk, is that it's actually cheaper to bulldoze and build new than it is to retrofit to current DDA standards. And it also gives us the option to redo the amenities in line with the site and make the site more user friendly in regards to connecting pathways and et cetera. So, um, you know, although it seems a shame, um, the amenities are as old as the pool. So I think we can get better bang for buck by building new on the site. Um, in, in regards to the, sorry, remind me what your first part was? Eight lanes. Eight lanes. Oh, the eight lanes. Yes, look, I, I think um, this, there's two reasons for this. One is that the feedback from the community suggested that uh, in peak times, that when there's uh, different user groups using the pool, then it can become crowded in terms of use. And if you're a lap swimmer, you know that you'll uh, use the pool specifically for that. You'll swim the black line and there'll be a number of uh, lanes uh, dedicated to, to swimmers in any pool for lap swimming. Uh, but certainly in times of school holidays and peaks and things like that, then it does provide the opportunity to have additional pool space to provide things like your um, uh, programming, your uh, aqua aerobics or even learn to swim. Um, so there is uh, more options for more uses with a larger pool. Um, you know, I did note Councillor 
Megan, in regards to her reference uh, in, the, in the comparison to the valley, well, it is slightly different in that the valley mm. is built specifically for water polo. So the depth of a pool is very important in regards to its functioning because obviously the deeper you have the pool, the more water, the more volume, the harder the filtration works, etc. So you know, we wouldn't be looking at doing something like that, but we certainly would use the extra two lanes to increase the utilisation of the pool for a wider scope of audience. If I might, just, can you comment on the extra cost from six to eight lanes? Yeah, look, the, the, the beauty is that, um, look, we'll work with the project team and I think we'll be able to take it to market to um, actually look at a like for like or a six with an option of an eight and see whether or not it's in budget. So, you know, I write it in the report because I don't want to come back to council asking for that. If we can fit it in, it'd be nice. If we can't, then we can always go um, with, with, with the, um, what's there now with the six lanes. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Sean. Uh, Councillor Carol Taylor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Just a few comments there. The eight lanes are more conducive to competition swimming, as well as the um, they used to hold the downs there, and I'm sure we get a new pool that would be the uh, ability to do that again and brings a lot of money into the community. People stay there for the three days and other things, and uh, we're getting to the stage in our wider Darling Downs where there are very few 50-metre pools being um, built. Um, eight lanes does add. Look, I do have to comment here. We talk about Milmerran Pool as if we're talking about a pool in Toowoomba. We're not. Mm. In country communities, they don't have very much. The students, the children, uh, on weekends. You know, in Gundawindi, we used to take picnics down to the pool when our kids were small, and we'd all meet under the trees there and spend the afternoon around the swimming pool. In Toowoomba, we've got all sorts of skate parks and all sorts of things, you know, mountain bike riding and all those things. In some of our smaller communities, we only have very few things, and the swimming pool in the summertime for a country community is virtually where it all happens. And I think we need to remember that. We're not talking about the likes of, say, Highfields or Toowoomba. We're talking about Milmarin, Cecil Plains, Clifton. Those sorts of areas are the same, and they don't have a lot of other things for the young people to do. I'd also like to say about the Valley Pool, my, it was the main competition pool for swimming in Brisbane before Chandler was opened. So before the Commonwealth Games came, the Valley Pool was actually where all competition swimming took place. Um, and it has been refurbed since then. It was the site of the original old baths in Brisbane, a very old, when they, when they did the, um, I can't remember when it was, but it would be about 60, 50, 50 years ago when they put the competition pool in there, they found all this old, old historic stuff from the very old pool that was there. So I support the 50, in fact, I'd like to move that this community values its 50 metres pool, and I think if it's possible for us to put the eight lanes in there, why would we not allow use, if the use is already needing eight lanes, why would we not have a look at that? I suspect it's not going to be a huge difference in cost. So I'm happy to move this. Milmerin deserves to have a pool. Milmerin deserves to have a 50 metre pool, and Milmerin deserves to have a big enough pool so that they can enjoy it in comfort and all different, like lap swimming and or aqua aerobics, and even just kids playing in the pool can all do that together. So I'm happy to move that, very pleased to move it, and very pleased, and I'd like to thank, through you, Chair Kent, for putting together such a good, um, and I agree, it's a, it's a long journey, it's a lot of money to spend, but I think it's a worthwhile project, and I'm very supportive of it. Thanks, Councillor Taylor. I do have a queue up of questions, but I do have a mover on the floor. Do I have a seconder for that motion? So, Councillor McMahon, so I'll sort of have a move and a seconder for that recommendation. But as I said, I do have a, a number of questions just lined up, so we'll work through those first. Councillor Vonhoff. Thank you, Mr Chair. Through you to Kent. Tar Kent. I just want to ask about the equitable access to the pool and the entire site with the proposed 50 metres. Um, and you were talking about DDA standards and I've been contacted by people who want to understand are the plans including ramp, a ramp or a hoist and or both? What's the preference and what's the plan for that? Oh, the preference is always a ramp these days. Mm -hmm. um, it's to build it yep, in great. the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. that, that's definitely the preference. That's it, yep. thank you. You're starting from first. Thanks, please. Councillor Bond. I forgot, uh, Councillor Carl. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. I've um, got a few questions, if I might. Um, first one, aquatic strategy. I 
thought we had an aquatic strategy in place some years ago, or I may be corrected on that. I, it could be around fee structure, but I thought it was a little bit more comprehensive. So is, is that the case and is it up for review or is this a new strategy? Uh, there, there was a document done in 2015, but it was never presented to Council, so it's not endorsed. And uh, the, the reason for the second part of that recommendation uh, Councillor Bill is because we were looking to update that information and a really um, drive an aquatics um, uh, strategy from this point onwards. So there's still information that's relevant from 2015 and we would use that as a starting point. But, but for me it's uh, about exploring what the network of aquatic facilities looks like now and in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. So another one yeah, from yeah. Thanks, Ken. Um, Notwithstanding the recommendation and community input, um, don't dispute replace like for like. I do have some questions around six versus eight, but um, the centre of my question around uh, uh, replacement is um, I, I find it hard to justify um, demolishing facilities on the site, demolishing the pool, getting rid of the existing tub, the, line, the liner, um, and constructing on an existing site. Mm -hmm. Now, notwithstanding the community import, but I, I, I just wonder the reasons. We all know demolition comes at a cost, which is another layer of cost onto the overall project of putting something new there. So did we exhaust every avenue around a greenfield site to build something new completely rather than knock everything over dig everything out and then start the new project uh, we we did consider uh, greenfield options but in terms of its current location there are some advantages um, one being that yes the demolishing um, does come with level of complications, but you do get the hole in the ground and that shouldn't be overlooked. You also get the civil that's already there, the infrastructure underneath the ground that's already there. So um, that, that is a good starting point for us. Um, the pool is um, well located. It's close to the um, uh, recreation hall. It's um, so in terms of, yes, we did consider it, um, but in the end, the uh, cost was um, prohibitive to uh, completely up and move the pool, given that we would probably have to demolish, fill the hole and make good on that site on top of moving to a greenfield site. Yep. Two, two more, just one yep. a supplementary to that one. And I've got another question, Mr Chair. Is, um, uh, you say the pipe work, you get the pipe work under the ground. I'm of the belief that um, the network that supplies the pool, that pipe work is leaking tens of thousands of litres a year. I, I wouldn't imagine we'd be using old network to service a new pool. Oh, well, it certainly is part of the project, councillor, is to look at everything we've got, make an assessment. If we need to renew it, renew it. Um, if we need to upgrade it, upgrade it. So, yeah, that's why I'm saying with a renovation, we. we that's why I'm, I'm, I'm asking the question because I'm finding it hard to justify in my own mind. If we put this back to a really, not a simple project, but a renovation on a house, you don't know what you know until you get there. And that's why it's often the case of building something on a greenfield, despite all the good reasons for location and that sort of stuff. But the, I'll leave that one. The... the uh, uh, if we're going to start an aquatic strategy after we build a pool and we determine about patronage, um, the example was used of high fields. If, if we are truly going to look at an aquatic strategy, I, 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 I'm asking the question why we're building a pool ahead of a strategy, because I, I, do we know the numbers of patronage? For example, because Highfields was raised, the, num the patronage at a 25 metre pool, uncovered, unheated, uh, versus a 50 metre pool in Milmerin, uncovered, unheated. Um, and the reason why I'm asking that in the context of a strategy, 
why wouldn't we have the strategy come first to look at some benchmarking um, around patronage and levels of service, like we've done with hierarchy of parks, the parks strategy, like we've done with other strategies, uh, levels of embellishment in the parks, um, in the LGIP levels of um, service, those sorts of things. I'm, I'm a bit perplexed about us jumping into a project first and then doing some benchmarking. Yep, fair question. Um, and th the answer is that we need to start at some point. Um, if we were to wait and do a strategy before we embarked on this project, then the pool at Milmirren could potentially be shut for the next two years with no access, while we determined what a network of pools across the community would look like, including the Milmirren pool. Or we could open it and leak up to 30,000 litres a day. Um, so for me, it's about um, starting at a point in time. And you would have um, seen in a couple of the uh, previous reports presented to Council that our um, attendance data, certainly in, in Milmerran, it's been steady over the last three financial years, <coughs> excuse me, um, excluding COVID, around about 12,000. And Councillor Bill, you're right, um, Highfields is one of our growth areas. Um, and I uh, write the recommendation in regards to considering a, a, um, a full and complete pool strategy and doing it now so that in one, five, six, seven, eight, nine years' time when I'm coming back to you to look at upgrades for Highfields, Pittsworth, Oakey, that we have a planned approach to that and we're not forced by the timeframes of a pool closure with a failing asset to make those decisions. We're making them well in advance. Thanks, Mr Chair. Thanks, Councillor Carl. Uh, Councillor Summerfield. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just in relation to the six lanes, how many lanes are there at Milne? Eight. 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 It's an eight lane. Yep. Yeah, for a city. You don't build six lanes. Okay. Um, I support the six lane. I have to. Mm. I have to say, I do support only six lanes, and I, I think there should be a bit of a straw poll around the room. To be honest, there's a bit of uh, variation in beliefs. So, um, the other thing was you said um, ramps are recommended. Is a ramp in going to be in this pool? Yes. It is. Yes. Thank you. And then my third question was, so the strategy that was previously done, why was that never presented to council? Oh, I'd have to defer to uh, GM Nick for that one. Um, thanks, Councillor Summerfield. The strategy was endorsed by council to go to public consultation. So it came to council and report for that. That consultation occurred um, there was no significant feedback received as a result of that consultation process and, um, and I, I, I couldn't answer you why it didn't come back to Council for final endorsement. However, that draft hasn't changed and has been being used as a guide for the upgrade of facilities around the region. I think it's fair to say that that aquatic strategy is a useful document and a good background planning document for where we want to go moving forward, but it, with the exception of um, our Milne Bay facility and the Highfields facility, it didn't look at our aquatic facilities as a network of, um, of facilities like uh, Mr Stroud spoken about and Councillor Carl, you alluded to the way we plan for parks, which is a, a great example of a hierarchy um, arrangement, levels of in service and levels of embellishment. It really just looked at those facilities and what they needed to have done to them to bring them to a, a, a current and modern operating arrangement. And that's where this project originally started, was as in response to, to that aquatic strategy which said, put in a ramp, upgrade the canteen and the change rooms, and that's where we started. And that was the original scope of works until we discovered that, that, was, that the asset was at the end of its useful life. So the, this next strategy is to, you know, to take that previous work and take it to the next step. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. I've got uh, Councillor McMahon. Thanks, Chair. A uh, few questions, if I could. Um, Kent, just wondering, um, I did uh, is pick up at that point that you can accommodate different user groups at this 50 metres. So I was just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. For example, if a, if a family with young kids came and said we wanted a shallow pool and the only thing we've got is a deep 50 metre or deeper, um, those options around accommodating different groups, could you elaborate on, on what that was? So some of it 
it revolves around the specific design of the pool. So it, it's how deep the pool needs to be um, across its entirety. So, you know, they, they can range anywhere from um, 1.2 metres um, for a um, diving end to a 1.8 to, you know, 2 metres plus for water polo and so forth. So, you know, we have the opportunity uh, to, to look at that in the design and, um, you know, the, the depth, you know, at a 1.2 um, would maximise that for play space, you know, and potentially provide space for that learn to swim option as well. Yeah, cool. Um, follow up. Um, I, I really like the idea that we um, we aren't revamping existing change rooms and, and those kind of things, but we are starting again. And just where I sit on the RADAC committee, um, retrofitting uh, is often more expensive than starting again. So I, I really welcome the disability access in both the change rooms and the pool uh, and our options around that. Um, RADAC at the moment is looking at options for disability access in in Milne Bay and it's not cheap and, and they don't usually uh, have a very long life, the options available. So I suppose my question is, um, could there be some consultation with the RADIC committee on disability access um, should we move forward with this option? Yeah, sounds like a great idea. Awesome. Final question, um, I, and I'm, I'm very happy to be the seconder of this motion and move forward with the, the 50 metre pool, whether your costings come in at six or eight, you know, that's, I think, a, a conversation to be had once costings are on the table. But um, I, I suppose I want to talk about this in the future, and we're at the point now where many of our, our swimming facilities are, are coming to the end of their life. Um, and when we look at 20 years from now and the community says, gee, we, we, we wish we had a, something uh, undercover for winter, for example, um, the, the, I suppose the question will have to be, well, in 40 years when, when we're at the end of life for this one, um, that's when we can have those conversations. So it is, it is a permanent 60-odd year life facility we're doing here. I just wanted to pick up on the community consultation and, and thanks for all the work that you and the team have done in consulting with the community out there. I can't remember, but it was 200 and something out of 300 and something wanted this option. And, mm. and, and fair enough, as a community representative, I suppose my job is to look at what the community consultation is saying. Um, but if, if I said to you, would you like a 25 or a 50? <laughs> like, of course you're gonna say a 50. So I just wonder if, um, I'm not saying at all that the community consultation is incorrect, but how we ask the consultation is something we can look at in the future, um, or if you think it was done accurately and this is an accurate example. I'd just like to comment on that. Well, we did work with uh, the stakeholder engagement team to deliver the consultation. Uh, it was done through a number of channels, face-to-face um, -face as well as uh, online. Um, yeah, well, there was over 300 unique responses, which was a great response for the Milmerin community. Yes, we've already looked at um, if we were to do this again, there's some improvements we would make to um, how we actually go to the community. But w we believe what was presented was a, a fair representation of the community's voice at, at that point in time. Yeah, thanks for you. And thanks for your answer. Thanks, thanks Councilman. Just before I go to Council McDonald, just quickly on that, I do think and can, correct me if I'm wrong, but when we went out with that consultation, it wasn't just do you want 50 or do you want 25, it was do you want 50 mm. or 25 all year round indoor, mm. correct? Uh, yeah, that's right. So the, the, um, the, it was yeah. very specific in that it was, could be a like for like or there could be something other than that and was included as a you know, 25 indoor. Um, yeah, so there, there were a number of options, but there was also some free text. There was questions that um, people asked. There was dialogue. So it wasn't just a tick box and you're done. You know, we, we did leave, uh, have a lot of community um, have conversations with people as well. So there was a lot of free text that indicated that, um, you know, w what they had I is what they wanted to have moving forward. Yeah. I'll just get quickly a GM Hauser to comment. Thank you, Mr Chair. I just wanted to make the point, councillors, that there was one other option that was put, and that's let's stop providing an aquatic facility and spend the money on, some, on, a, on something else. So that option was put to the community as well. So it wasn't just, we're going to replace your pool, what would you like? And there was also a question of, would you prefer that we don't replace the pool and we can spend the money on other community infrastructure? We didn't get many votes. Uh, it got one vote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councillor McDonald. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Mr Chair. Just a couple of comments and then um, a question and perhaps the mover might consider just a, 
an addition to the recommendation and, and the second for that matter. Um, first comment was around the, the operation or operating uh, costs for the 50 metre outdoor pool and the 25 metre indoor pool, which um, was a bit of a revelation to me, mm. I thought, 50% uh, less to, uh, to operate the outdoor 50 metre pool. Um, which, you know, that, that's more a comment. It was just a fact that I thought was quite quite odd um, for me. But yet, when you work through the uh, all the other variations, you can understand why it would be. Um, in regard to the other pools and the bus that's coming around the corner for some more, um, did you want to just touch on quickly the Oakey pool, how it's in, in the report, it talks about, uh, it's on page 66 of board books, that it's, it's got known leaks increasing water and chemical use at the time of the data collection. Is that something that we should be mindful of now in, in regard to you know, what repercussions there might be as a result of this decision? Uh, yes, and, and we are mindful of it, Councillor Jeff. Um, I'd probably say that um, as an asset, Oakey's probably in better condition than some of our other pools. But this is, it's definitely a watching brief. Yep. Terrific. So that would be part of that, um, that motion number two. Yes, that's up there. That's right. Terrific. Um, next question is probably through you, uh, Mr. Chair, through to the acting GM of Finance and Business in regard to the financials, and uh, and note the the plan of of uh, spreading the costs over three financial periods. I just wanted to comment from uh, the acting GM in regard to the, the work that's being done on this already and, and uh, you know, obviously this is an addition to our 10-year capital works and where that sits. Good morning, councillors, and thank you for the question. I've been working very closely with Nick and Kent and the team on this project. Um, as you said, it will be spread across three years, so six million um, will need to be absorbed within that 165 million capital works parameters. So bearing in mind that we have quarantined the additional works for dam spillways and water treatment plant, but we need to maintain our capital works at 165 and the funding for this project will be included in that. Thanks, um, and just a quick follow up on that. Would there be some elements of this that could be treated as uh, as the, the COVID uh, pandemic response in, in that 50 million? So the, the COVID, the pandemic response was 64 projects at 50 million and we have contained, we've contained that body of works for those 64 projects. So yeah, it'll, it'll just be note the scope's changed quite a lot from when this was first put forward to what it is now and whether there was an opportunity to um, yeah, assist so through local contractors and what have you. Yeah, so certainly as we work through um, the budget development for 21-22, so um, it is going to be an extremely tight budget to, to bring down. There's a lot of demand for scarce resources, um, but certainly it's, that is something that we could look at, at how we fund this project. Thanks. So Thank I'm you for happy that. Happy to bring that one back. Terrific. Um, next one is really more a, a comment, maybe the mover and seconder might think this through as well. Um, when Councillor Shine and myself were, were out at the pool, comment was made and we thought it was a reasonable comment um, in regard to the season, which will be the 21-22 season where the pool will be closed for works and whether uh, access to whether it's Cecil Plains or Pittsworth pool uh, could be made available at a different rate or free of charge for the users of the Mumeran pool, given the fact that they'd have to travel uh, to and from those venues, and wondered whether there was consideration given to that, included in the project in the in the project costs that we could uh, perhaps accommodate. It's not specifically included in that number, Councillor Jeff, but we could certainly have some conversations with the community about their appetite to travel to their neighbouring pools, and then work with Gary's team on. Um, some reduced, if not free, entry for a period of time. That's great. It's probably not going to any going to do it. Sorry. It would probably Sorry. only be competition kids, or you know, really. Yeah, um, well, I'm more talking about the the folk we were with, and there was about 20 people there that, um, you know, every day of the week, and um, you know, to have that opportunity for them to do, it, and some of which, you know. It's right to say we'll go to a gymnasium, but some of which are incapacitated when you mm. get to that, and then mm. the pool is a, of uh, therapeutic yeah. use more so than, than anything else. So uh, take on board 
that comment from uh, from Kent and whether we need anything in the motion for you to act that out um, doesn't worry me but I think it, as long as it's taken that communication mm. will take place but mm. the only motion I would put in there is that users of the Moomeran pool through the 21-22 season uh, gain free access to either Cecil Plains or Pittsworth pool for that season. Or would you say any pool? Do we need to have or any pool motion? in the region? Milne Bay? Or any pool. I don't think so. But Kent has explained that he's that there's a conversation going to take place. So if that's if that will take place, then perhaps you can just inform us of that yeah, outcome. Yeah. Oh, look, my preference would be not to have it as part of the recommendation, but to allow the project to address that as part of its scope moving forward. No, and and if need be, we can report back on that. Yeah, no, I'm happy with that. It's it, it's not a large quantum, so yeah, I'm okay. happy with that. So we'll give that due consideration, as said, during the scope of the project. Um, got a few more. Uh, Councillor Shine. Uh, yeah, Kent, uh, uh, just uh, uh, having had, uh, or being aware of some experience of a uh, domestic household pool, um, the uh, diagnosis was that the, the leaking of it was due to cracks in the, in the, in the pool itself. Uh, after a lot of expense and trial and error, it was finally determined that uh, uh, it, were, it was the leaky was coming from pipes. Um, the, probably a tenuous sort of connection there, but I was just wondering whether during the process of demolishing the existing pool, will it be able, will, is it possible to uh, ascertain the reason for this current leak, se severe leaks out there at uh, Mill Merrin, in the hope that that might inform us uh, about uh, what uh, treatment um, or rectification work might need to be done in other pools in the region? Uh, yes, certainly we can work with uh, the contractor on that. But we, we do have a good idea. We have taken concrete core samples. Um, this is an inter interesting scenario with this pool specifically where there's a um, original concrete um, pool basin, then you've got uh, a fibreglass one over the top of it, which was seen as a, um, a remediation some time ago. You've got water caught between those two things, um, water slipping over the sides, then corroding the pool. Um, so w we do have a fair idea as to what has caused the issues, but certainly w we would um, you know, be working closely with our contractor if, in case they come up with something that we, we might not know. Yep. Yep. Uh, Councillor O'Hara Sullivan. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, it's just a quick one, Kent, about the methodology. When you talk about non-unique responses were received, meaning people could vote for more than one option, why do you do that? Uh, well, you, uh, can, you talk about some of the lessons learned from our surveys, and um, you know, it's one of the things we, we would do differently next time. Um, I think in terms of the dialogue with um, customers, when you're having that face-to-face, -face, you know, there's, um, if there's options to potentially vote for more than one, they did. Um, but to, to note, there was uh, 300 unique users, uh, unique voters, right? So, so I think the total survey response was 330, but we have um, uh, certified that it's uh, 300 unique responses. That's just not what it says in the report. It says um, 331 non-unique responses. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so of, of those, of those 330, 300 were unique. Oh. Yes. Yep. Sorry, sorry, I was confused there. So there's 300 unique responses. So individuals... So they only voted once. You that's right. That yep. Okay. yep. So there was, you know, approximately 30 people that voted twice. Thank you. Uh, I've got Councillor Carl. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a question, replacing like for like versus uh, upgrade, and not, that's notwithstanding that when we build this facility and the adjoining um, facilities that, that service the pool as part of the complex, they've got to be brought up to today's standards. That's, that's a given. But like for like versus upgrade, um, do we have any costings around the difference on, and I'm particularly asking in the context of asset management, whole of life. Um, we, we, I, and I ask this question on the, on the broader sense that we as a council, uh, uh, 
witness an ever-increasing uh, northward asset management bill depreciation. So I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm probably signalling I want to go to debate on this because of, but a, I'm open to an answer about is there any costings on difference like for like versus upgrade? Uh, if, if I guess the main comparison in regards to this would be the six lanes versus the eight lanes, mm -hmm. and no, we don't have hard data to, to give an exact um, life cycle costing on what an additional two lanes would be. Um, but in, in the scheme of things over a 50 year life cycle, it would be relatively minimal in regards to the mm -hmm. increased body of water and the increased construction costs. I, I appreciate that, Ken, on a project by project basis, but it's also <coughs> death by a thousand cuts on a total asset management bill for a, a $500 million asset base um, for council. Absolutely. Okay, I might close questions there with the sense that we might be going to debate. I do have a mover of the Sorry. motion in. Sorry, uh, question? Uh, yep. Chair. So. Um, can we get clarified whether councillors would prefer it to be simply a six lane pool rather than an eight? Because, you know, this is a lot of money to be Mr. invested. Mr Chair, can I call a point of order? I think Kent has said in his, in his, they would come back to us with the costings between a six and an eight metre pool. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear. Lane that. pool. And the fact is, a competition pool is eight lanes. If Milmerin Council were building a pool now, they wouldn't be building six and neither would Pittsworth and the actual depth of a pool has got a lot to do with, yeah. you know, competition for okay. swimming. Okay, so I think we, Councillor, yeah, I so appreciate that. I think we've, we've clarified, we've, we have clarified that. So are we comfortable, as I said, so we're in a position now. So Thank I do you. have a mover of the motion in Councillor Carol Taylor, a seconder of the motion Thank in, you. And I'd like to, Council, I'd like to yeah, sum up. Of, Thank you. In Councillor McMahon. Just one yeah. final Sorry, point. just, just to clarify, um, I didn't say that we, I would come back. I said that if we could fit the eight lane proposal within the budget that's being adopted today. Yes, okay, yeah, well, that's virtually that. Yeah. So, so yeah. I just want to clarify there, uh, if, if I'm required to come back to council at some point in time, that's at the um, request of the chamber. Um, otherwise, I'm proposing an eight lane if we can fit it within the budget that's being adopted today. Okay, so question? If I could please, I would like to know the costs um, between the six and the eight. And the thought process shouldn't be whether we can fit it in the $6 million budget, but rather what savings can be made um, to reduce our costs, because this is a huge cost. Hmm. Do, you, do you want to answer that? No? Uh, well, uh, uh, if uh, just needs to be noted that if we're coming back to uh, get a decision on whether we're six or eight lanes, then it probably adds another two months to the schedule, mm -hmm. um, given the report cycle, um, if, if I'm uh, requiring a council decision, um, which can be done, and, and we'll, we'll work that in. Um, otherwise, then there's parameters today that um, could potentially be set if... Um okay, so... Um, so Mayor, oh, sorry, Mayor Antonio? Look, uh, didn't, wasn't there some discussion before that we were going to the market for a six or an eight lane and, and look at the uh, look at the cost of that? That's, that gave me some comfort. And uh, if that's the case, well, let's get on with it. Well, what I might going do is... Going to the market sorry, for a six yeah. or an eight. So what I might do is I'll, I'll go to... So that's the, that is the, the recommendation that sits that I do have a mover and a second for... Are the mover and the second are comfortable with their position of moving and seconding that... So, Mr Chair, I'd, I'd like to move that if the eight-lane pool fits under the budget, then that's what we build. OK, so... Because that was my intention. So if we change... The, so what is something like demolish the existing pool on amenities and build a new eight-lane 50-metre pool on amenities with alloc... Uh, sub... Uh. Well, it says there with the allocated preliminary budget, so that, yeah, that probably virtually that. says... The it. report does contain the specifics so, around... Carrot, so you're moving that? I am actually that. moving that, thank you, yes. Sec is the seconder, Councillor McMahon, are you comfortable with...? Yeah, and uh, sorry, can't you just mumble? If, if it can't fit under that, it's outlined in the report that it will will investigate six lanes if we can't fit under that budget? Is that no, I guess what I'm saying is that we would do a level of value management um, based on scope um, once we get to that point. Yep. Yeah. And one of the things we would consider first up would be what is the cost saving between an eight lane and a six lane? I'm happy to second. Okay, so I've got a mover and a seconder. 
Would anyone like to go into debate? I'd like to sum up. So, thank you. Yeah, so, we've got, yep, so Councillor Carr's indicated to go into debate. So I'll go to mover of thank the motion Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Mr. <coughs> Chair. And uh, I, I actually am, um, need to remind you that this pool was built by the Mulmerian Council over 50 years ago. It served that community well. And for a small community to have a 50 metre six lane pool at that time would have been just state of the art. And I've sat around that pool many, many times and we've had Darling Downs championships there many, many times. Those small communities don't have a lot of things. They don't have a lot of infrastructure for their students. And we're looking at this, if we do have an eight lane pool, which is what, if the Mulmerian Council were still there today, they would be building an eight lane pool. That's what they would be building. So we need to be mindful of that. The fact is it allows competition swimming. It's got the depth for water polo to be held there, which is having a, a great resurgence on the downs and is a wonderful team sport for our competition swimmers to participate in. It has actually needed, the depth is actually needed for aqua aerobics as well. And if we can fit it in under the, under the budget, I see no reason why we shouldn't. I will find, as, as Kent has mentioned, you would find that the all of life costs between a six and an eight lane pool would be very, very minimal. I think to balance any of those costs out would be the fact the extra use and the extra um, activities that are allowed to be held, to allowed to be conducted there, particularly at the same time as we're talking on weekends when uh, you, know, you might want to have some people lap swimming, some children playing, and some others doing some, throwing a ball around in there or doing something else like that. I think you're never going to have small communities, they're never going to have the numbers that you're going to have in large communities. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't have access to those facilities. In fact, I think it means that they should have should be more considered for access to those for those facilities rather than in the in the bigger areas. In Toowoomba here, if you can't get into Mill Bay, you can go somewhere else. In Milmerin, it's a darn long way to go to somewhere else. So I think that um, you know their pools are very valued, and I think that um, it'd be very retro-minded. Uh, we've gone to the community, we've consulted, we've gotten their opinion, and now we're going to try to adjust. Some of us might think that that's not not what we want to build there. I strongly support us building a, a 50 metre pool and what we need to build there to make it amenable to that community. And I think that it would be very, very silly for us, considering that this facility will last for another 50 years, to build a six lane pool rather than an eight when there's be minimal cost. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Teller. Speaker against, Councillor Carl. Thank you, Chair. Um, I definitely support a 50 metre pool in Milmerin, and yes, I am speaking against the motion. Um, uh, I feel uncomfortable about replacing a pool uh, outside the guidelines of like for like, in a nutshell. I've raised the issues in around discussion around in my question time about um, uh, the issue of asset management and an increasing asset management uh, register in under the accounting practices or principles that we have to work under from QTC. That's a reality we work with. Um, and in the context of a head of a strategy, I agree with the officer, we cannot afford to let 30,000 litres of water leak per day. We need to get on with it, but I'm comfortable under the parameters of a like for like ahead of a strategy that identifies standards of service for right across uh, this region that is equitable and accessible for all our residents. I do have some mis misgivings about the extent to which uh, the uh, consultation with due respect, Kent, um, uh, a greenfield versus brownfield a rebuild um, is no doubt that there would be a considerable sum added to this bill, uh, which will put stra strain under the, uh, the preference of an eight lane or a six lane, whereas a greenfield site, we probably wouldn't be having the discussion. We'd probably just build the eight lane 50 metre well within the context of the allowed budget. Um, and it's important uh, that we look 
fiscally across the whole, not just at this project, but across the whole business of council, across the directorates, uh, and how we look at this curve that we're on around uh, uh, like for like, or the new component that we have to contend with on an asset register and depreciation into the future. So that's why I absolutely support a 50 metre like for like in Milmarin at this stage and urgently, but I can't agree to extending beyond that uh, in having the mind frame that I offered fits within the budget. I agree with Council and Nancy's comments that we should be approaching it from a different mindset around uh, savings not at the detriment of the community. If I, and I put myself genuinely in a community member's place out there, would I be happy with a like for like? A hand on heart, I think I could answer yes. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Carl. As second to the motion, Councillor McMahon, do you wish to speak in favour? Unless there was anyone else that would like to, I'm, I'm happy to, Chair. Um, look, I think when we look at what, what we have here, um, if we were in Toowoomba, we only have one 50 metre, but we have, you know, multitude of schools that have their own that are they're open to the public. So we really do have those options. And when we get further out of Toowoomba, the amount of options we have are, are limiting. And this is such a hub for the community. I appreciate that when this project started, uh, the cost was significantly under and we were going to do a patch up job, but let's, let's do it properly and do it now. And really have something that could be a legacy project left there for many years to come. And, and I, I, I honestly, from, from where I sit in this portfolio and see uh, the data around the life of our swimming pools across the region, this is going to have to be an area that we look at in the future. And I, and I welcome the development of a strategy that looks to network these or, or looks to um, look at end of life and where we need to go from there, because I think that's important. But I. I just from pro previous uh, life of, of standing there with a starting gun on many swimming carnivals, I, I couldn't see any school getting value out of a six lane 50 metre pool, to be, if I'm honest. And if, unless there was a very significant cost saving, and I agree, once you start chlorinating and filtrating the whole thing, the, the cost difference of a six to an eight in the long term, I don't think there's too much different with. So I'm happy with an eight, eight lane, and I, I think. Um, Kent and his team and some of the guys up the back for the work that they've put into this over a long period of time. I see my job as a community representative to listen to the concerns of the community and when it's this strongly in favour of this, I'm very happy to be doing my part to get this motion um, as it should be. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Mullen. Do I have a speaker against? Uh, Councillor Summerfield. Thank you. Um, I'm very disappointed that eight lanes has been inserted in there and for that reason, I am going to feel a need to vote against this. I think um, if we can provide like to, for like at a community such as Milmerin, they would be very thankful. And I don't think that they were saying we want a 50 metre pool that's got eight lanes. I think they were just would be grateful that they were getting a 50 metre pool. I, I don't know where the eight lane even came from. But seriously, I am so disappointed that uh, the focus is on eight lanes and $6 million instead of a like for like and let's save as much money as we can. You know, recently in, in some of our uh, budget updates, we've been hearing about uh, projects that have been saving money, and, and I'm encouraging that all areas of our council try and find ways to save money on all of these projects. So I'm against it, I'm sorry. I would fully support a pool for Milmerin, a like-for-like -like pool. Thanks, Councillor Summerfield. A speaker for? Okay, so no other speakers for or against. So we'll close the debate. Councillor Taylor, would you like to sum up? Um, th thank you, Mr Chair. The, the eight-lane pool that's up there um, has to fit under the budget for that to go through there. And the six million, and as Kent has mentioned, um, savings will try to be found. And if it should not, then it will come back to us. That's correct, Kent? Yep. Thank you, through you, Mr Chair. I would just like to ask my colleagues why Milmerin deserves less than anywhere else. 50 years this facility has been in this community, well used for 50 years. Why would you build an, a six metre pool now when, the, when there is a small amount of growth, the pool is well used? Why would you say to them, 
They're less important than anywhere else and they have to have a six metre pool regardless of what the future might hold for that community. There's underwater soccer, there's all those sorts of things they can now play in deep water and uh, as well as water polo and other things and normal just use for health and fitness, learn to swim, school, the school uses it extensively and I think that Milmere, and if, should it fit under the budget? I'm not certainly one to be wasting money, but I see no reason why the township of Milmere deserves less than a more populated township. And I suggest that that eight metre, eight lane pool, should it fit under the budget, the ongoing costs, the whole of life costs between it and, a, and an eight metre, it and a six lane pool will be minimal. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. So, councillors, the committee recommendation is that council approve option five, which is demolishing. Chair, Chair uh, I'd just like to move an amendment uh, to the motion before you put it. Can we do that? We can move it. Yeah. Okay, yep, so. Uh, my, uh, the amendment I move is that to delete the words uh, eight lane. So it'll read a new 50 metre pool. Future motion, vote on that one first. Well, it's this, got to get up first. Okay. So, will. okay. So just so this is what your here. this is your amended motion we've got here. So just as <laughs> country communities. Sorry. So that that's what what's what's in front of us here. That's the amendment. Your the amendment is just to delete those the, the word eight. Okay. Do I have a? Do I have to get a second for that, officer? Yeah. Is there a seconder for that, Councillor Summerfield? Speak, speak. Okay, so all right, so we'll go. Uh, Councillor Sean, would you like to speak to the just, just briefly, amended I, motion? I was very uh, um, influenced by the remarks of, uh, of Councillors uh, Summerfield and uh, Carl uh, in relation to what they've said about this. Um, I think it deserves, because of the amount involved, further investigation, perhaps some explanation as to why it does take. Uh, an extra two months. I just don't know why that would be. I have doubts about that, but I'm not qualified to comment. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, we haven't heard anything about um, what impact the extra two lanes will make for the, with respect to the space for the rebuilding of the amenities, etc. Um, and looking at the population of uh, Melmerin over the last uh, 55 years since the pool's been in existence and the, the likelihood of its expansion in the future, it really doesn't um, justify uh, an increase in size um, in the absence of any concrete evidence uh, of the extra cost involved. I certainly would be happy with an eight lane pool if the cost involved were uh, negligible uh, from the uh, six lane one, but I'm yet to be, in the absence of that, uh, I feel it uh, uh, unwise to support the, uh, the original motion and hence the reason for the amendment. Thanks, Councillor Shine. Do we have a speaker against? That's a question. A question. Please. Question, Councillor Vonnell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, in reality, the uh, foreshadowed motion there that um, Councillor Shine has put forward. Would would that come back to Council then with six lanes equals X, eight lanes equals Y? No. That's right. No. Yes. It doesn't say that, does yeah. it? No, uh, um, my well, reading of it is, its and wording. it's pretty close to the original recommendation in the report is that if the pool as specified in the report, which is an eight lane 50 metre pool, is within the allocated budget of $6 million, mm. we will do it. Same as the last one. Yeah. Yeah, that, if I so, sorry, so Councillor Von Off, did you have any? So then my question uh, through you, Chair, to Councillor Shine is, is it his intent that that would th those that information would actually come back to Council for consideration to see if the cost is negligible? Yeah. The answer is yes. Would you would you consider amending your motion to reflect that, uh, Councillor Shine? Yes. yes. Um, 
So, Council the Sean, would you like to make, would you like to amend the yeah, motion? Just think about that. Yeah. Um, can we help you? Yeah. yeah. So, perhaps just a, a number two, which is that Council receives a report identifying the, the costs between a six and eight lane pool um, to make a decision, something like that. Number three, two becomes three. Question, if I might, please. I'll just, I'll just, um, we'll just get the wording of this first of all, Councillor Taylor. So that, is that what we're talking about? Yep. So that would become number two of the report, and the bottom one becomes three. So the council receive a report identifying the costs of a six and eight lane pool before making a decision to proceed. And then the bottom point will be three. So three council gives consideration to funding a development of regional aquatics strategy. So just so that that's the okay. So is the second comfortable with that? So move in a second. I have a, I have a question. Thank you. Question through you to uh, Kent, please. How long do you think this pool, the community without a pool? How long do you think this would extend the um, uh, the wait for their new facility? Look, I, I think I could still, um, I still estimate that we would be able to be on track for a late 2022 finish. Um, this does add probably a minimum of a month just into the schedule, but there is a little bit of contingency in there. Um, and while I've got the floor, perhaps the um, it's a, not necessarily identifying the cost, but it's the difference between. Because when we go to the tender process, the negotiations with um, probably the, the top two successful tenderers around the value management of the project, we would ask them what is the difference between delivering a six and delivering an eight at that point in time, because there's other variables they consider in their total build cost um, as to not just um, you know a, an extra two metres of concrete. So something along these lines that's is that what you're suggesting? The cost difference between a six lane and an eight lane. The cost pool. difference. The cost difference. Yeah. That's right, yep. Two. So we'd, we'd need to go through the full tender process, receive that, and then talk with probably the top two tenderers around the scope and the difference in costs. Councillor Shine, as the mover of this motion, <coughs> are you happy to take that yes. suggestion on board? Yes. Second of the motion agrees? Okay. And that answers your question. Sorry, I've just got Councillor McMahon had a, a question. Oh, look, no, my question was exactly the same. Just if we start in this winter, 21, 22, <coughs> start out, as long as with this motion you're confident to have it done by 22, 23 summer, you said you have, I'm happy. So, so when? Late, what? late 2022. What, well, late, late sorry, 2022. can I Councillor McMahon, can I I'll clarify just, I'll just get, I'll just How get much the of the summer <coughs> are we going to miss? I'll just get the... Manager to answer. Yes, so we will miss <coughs> uh, one whole season, which is this yes, one I approaching. That, yeah. um, and then we would aim to be uh, open as early as possible into the 2022 summer season. But if I could have a follow up there, you said it would be late. So the season actually will start September, October. So when do we suggest that this might be open? Uh, I, I, we, there is too many variables to actually put a, a day and a month. I'm, I'm <coughs> more comfortable with late 22. So late 22 is the best estimation at this stage? By Christmas? Well, late 20. Well, well look, the, obviously the project, the officers want to get the pool open as it's soon as important. possible. Like, there's no doubt about that. And we'll work hard to do that. Um, but I, I cannot nominate a specific uh, month in 2022. There's too many variables to consider. Councillor Carl, you had a question? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just through you, I'm interested, Councillor Shine raised some valid points there around the need for the standard of pool that we're looking to supply, uh, hence some comments around the uh, growth of Mill Merrin over the last X amount of years. I just wanted to ask Councillor Shine, are you you unpack that, are we, are, do you think we're capturing, you know, it's one thing to do look at a cost comparison, but on a needs analysis, which is, should be any component of, uh, a component of any project. Um, I'm just wondering whether we're hitting the target here with what the issues you raised. Well, 
all I'm saying is that I, I'm unaware of any factors which would indicate that the sizeable mirror will appreciate greatly over the next 50 years based on what's happened over the last 55 years. And uh, when you comp compare uh, what we have in Toowoomba at Mill Bay for a population that we have compared with the very much smaller population of Mill Mirror, I think Mill it's Bay, uh, yeah. we owe it to the ratepayers to uh, uh, to look at the difference you know, between those comparative. And that's sizes. what I where I thought you were heading, Councillor Sean. And you know, through you, Chair, I. I not just a report back on the, dis the difference between the cost of concrete, but a need, some sort of justified needs analysis um, outside of the community survey um, would be beneficial for me to understand um, if I'm to support um, anything outside a, a like for like. I, I think that's an important component for all of us to consider. Um, and then I hark back to the comments about, you know, project ahead of strategy. I get the timing, I get the criticality, um, and because it may just set a precedent or a benchmark ahead of our strategy. That's why I ask Councillor Sean. And thanks, Councillor Sean, for clarifying that. Okay, so uh, I do want to get this ship back on track, but I've got another, uh, another question. So, sorry. So, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, sorry. Mr. Yeah. Chair, can we? Oh, I'm not comfortable that that information will come back to us. So is that going to come back to us or...? Okay, I... What information? Uh, I'm unsure is exactly what you're well, defining with needs well, analysis, Councillor Bill. Well, um, in the context of what Councillor Shine was saying, um, the size of the community, the growth of the community, the projected growth of the community, are we building a suitable standard? Are, are we over-investing? Are we under there, I think that needs to be a component of our consideration in um, in building this standard of the project and considering the amount of money we're spending. Well, well I, I would argue that in previous reports and in this report, based mm. on the community feedback, and that was um, the additional uses for the pool, apart from lap swimming, mm. um, increased space would provide those opportunities. Um, the demographic and participation data was presented in the last report. It was around about 12,500 to 13,000 uh, users per year. That was consistent um, over the last three uh, fi financial years of operation. So it's been steady in terms of participation. Um, and, you know, we, we would uh, forecast that with a new facility, there might mm. be a bump in participation based on the um, yeah. more usability of, of, a, of a bigger pool space. Yes, and through you, Chair, I, I appreciate uh, Kent, that thinking and that methodology you're applying, but if we based it on that alone, we'd probably build five Olympic pools in Toowoomba right now. I'm saying uh, in the context of, of the critical need and, and balancing that across uh, an entire council region. Yeah. Okay. I've got uh, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Mr Chair. If we were building Milne Bay now, we wouldn't build it like it is. It'd probably be much bigger and it'd probably be much deeper. We put all the money we have and strategies into mountain biking. We have opportunities here with Olympics to have water polo and others stationed here, and we don't have the swimming pools yeah. that are needed to have them. So what we would be doing here is limiting. I'm, I say again... It's a Councillor small Taylor, community. Sorry, I'm just we're going to debate. Did you want to speak again? I've got a mover and a second of it. Did well, I'm speaking you against it. Yeah, yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm just in questions I at the am, moment. because so we I'll have a I'll come small... To you. Yes, I'll come to you when we get to speaking against. Do you have a question at the moment? No, I don't no. have a okay, question. Okay, well, I'll hold. Does anyone else have any questions before I get back on track? Councillor McMahon? Thanks, Chair. Just um, to Councillor Shine, the second part of this motion, look, I, I'm wondering uh, if, if I could convince you just to, re to remove that second part of... Um, for the reasons being, I, I don't think we need to delay this. Is that a question or debate? No, this is a question to yes. Councillor Shine. Uh, if we delay this further with, with the information coming back to us, I'm quite happy that without that, the motion is as written in the it's report, the which is to get the officers to build the best pill they can for $6 million. Exactly. I'm just wondering if, if the second part um, would just unnecessarily delay... Um, 
this whole project and, and if you'd consider on that grounds taking it out. Councillor Shine. Just a clarification of the question. The second part meaning number two or meaning... Number two. All of number two. No, number two is critical to the amendment. Okay. Okay, so that solves that. So I've got a mover of this amendment. Action. I've got a seconder. So I've got a mover in Councillor Shine. I've got a seconder in Councillor Summerfield. Councillor Shine has spoken in favour of the motion. If there are no further questions, so we'll go back to the debate. Speaker against, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I cannot uh, understand why we are saying that one of, it is amazing how we say in this room that we support our regional communities. It is amazing when we say that, uh, but we'll only do it when it suits us and we'll only do it, I mean, the place like Milmerran, even Pittsworth, Clifton, uh, um, others are never going to have the users that they have in other more densely populated areas. Why does Milmerran deserve less of a standard for growth and for, it's not even just about the population growth, it's about the use of the pool, the use of the facility. You can now play underwater hockey, you can now play soccer underwater, you can play water polo, there are many things. Don't we want to encourage our community to be healthy? And as was mentioned here before, people who have certain disabilities cannot jog or run or other things, but they're weightless in the, in the water. So that, that is obviously an opportunity for them to use a new facility and to be, be fit. There may well be that we have more, if we have a bigger pool, I'm sure there would be, that we would have more percentage of the community using the facility to keep fit. That's in, in addition to the learn to swim and, and the um, recreational use of that on weekends. I cannot believe that if this fits under the six million dollars that we are going, it's like our flood recovery, we're not doing any betterment. We're going to consign them to something that is exactly the same that was built 50 years ago. And I think that that is actually a retrograde step. I understand <coughs> that if it costs more than six million, then council needs to consider it. But this community deserves an eight lane pool if it fits under that. And it deserves it no less than the community of Highfields or Toowoomba or anywhere else for that matter. And I rest my case. I'm against this amendment. And I think we should go ahead with, if we can fit the aid under six million, what makes Milmerin less worthy than anywhere else? Thanks, Councillor Taylor. Uh, Councillor Summerfield is the seconder of that motion. Do you wish to speak? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I, I think today we're looking at a glass half full, not a glass half empty. We're actually not saying you can't have a pool. We're saying that we suggest like for like you're actually getting exactly what you've already got. So, you know, I don't think the p people of Milmerran will be complaining about that. I think they will appreciate the fact that council is finding the funding to ensure that they get their pool replaced. The pool that they've always had, they will have again, and they'll get in, um, improved facilities, which will also be beneficial to the community. So I don't think we should be negative Nelly about this. This is something to celebrate that we're going to provide a six or eight, depending on the budget. I still believe we should be thinking about our cost savings, not how much we can get for our six million dollars. Um, we should be celebrating the fact that we're actually ensuring Milmerran continues to have a pool which supports their community and brings all the people together, and it's a great thing. Thanks, Councillor Summerfield. Speaker against? Councillor McMahon. Uh, just just to pick up on that, I don't think replacing an eight metre, an eight lane with a six lane is like for like. That's all, it's thank you. Line. It's six lane now. Six lane. It's, six, it's six lane. 50 oh, yeah. years old. Retract. No, uh, do I have a uh, speaker for the motion? I feel like an auctioneer. Okay, no further bids. Sum up. Yeah, just briefly, uh, the, the issues have been covered pretty well, I would have thought, uh, but as, uh, as uh, councillor, Summerfield said, what well, all we're proposing is that we replace uh, the existing six-lane pool with uh, a new one. Uh, we're giving to Milmerin what, as I understand from having been there very recently and speaking to uh, the users of the pool, just we're giving them what they want. Um, I think it will be well received as, as it should be. Um, I, there is a obvious difference between 
the needs of Toowoomba and Highfields, as the example is given by, by Councillor Taylor, simply in the, the uh, number of people that uh, will use it, or the population in those areas, a huge, huge difference. Um, and uh, there's uh, uh, you, there'd be no uh, evidence that the uh, benefit to that community would be diminished by having what they've been used to for a long time, six lanes as opposed to eight lanes in terms of health or access to it. Um, another consideration, of course, is that if um, the, the costs uh, which are yet to come in uh, for a six-lane pool uh, exceeds $6 million, where do we go from, from, from there? One assumes that, uh, obviously, an eight-lane one would be dearer still. So. Uh, Yes, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Shine. So, councillors, before you, that the motion is that Council approve option five, demolish the existing pool and amenities and build a new 50 metre pool and amenities on the current site in Milmerran with an allocated preliminary budget of $6 million. Two, that Council receive a report identifying the cost difference between a six and eight lane 50 metre pool before making a decision to proceed. And three, that Council give consideration to funding the development of a regional aquatic strategy during preparation of the 21-22 budget. Those in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that is carried. That's, that's the amendment. Now we're going to a motion there. So, yes, yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, so that's the amendment. So that mo the amended motion is carried. So it becomes... Becomes a motion. That becomes the motion. It. Yeah. So then I just re-vote on that. You've got to put the motion. So we put that mo sorry. Yeah, so so that now becomes the, the motion. So moved right. by yeah. Councillor Sean, seconded by Councillor Summerfield. Does anyone wish to go into debate? No, we can't win. those in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the motion is carried. <laughs> Thanks, Kent. Um, <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. So, councillors, I now uh, the Environment Community Committee. So we go to an adjournment. So we'll resume at the conclusion of the Economic Development Committee. So can I get a mover to? No. Do I need? Move? Yeah. Mover to adjourn. <laughs> Councillor Vonolf, Councillor McMahon. Those in favour? So we have a break. All right, uh, councillors. So we will take a short break. What's the time? 10:45. So what? Back at 11. Is that fair? That's what do you want? Back at 11? Yep. Everyone's comfortable with that? Right.
welcome to the Finance and Business Strategy uh, Committee meeting for the month of March. Uh, we welcome, obviously, the Mayor and fellow councillors and acknowledged Councillor Shine as a portfolio leader for Finance and Business Strategy um, Committee. This meeting, obviously, is open to the public and uh, will also be live streamed. I'd like to thank everyone that's in the room, uh, including the CEO, Brian Pigeon, Acting General Manager, Finance and Business, Anne-Marie Johnson, and the other members of our executive and staff that are present in the room today. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Aboriginal parties whose songlines traverse these lands we meet on today, the Western Waka Waka, Gaibal, uh, and Jarrawa peoples and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the knowledge, rich traditions and bold ambitions of Australia's first people. Uh, with those um, introductory comments, um, councillors, we move to item number two, which is the attendance, including apologies, leave of absence, declaration of conflict of interest. There's no apologies, uh, no leave of absence, as I'm aware of. And at this point, there are no declarations. If councillors have any declarations through the course of the committee meeting, feel free to please alert uh, us of that. And likewise, if you are a councillor and you um, suspect that someone else may have a conflict, you, know, you certainly are obliged to do the same. We move then to item number three, which is the 21-22 uh, financial year register of fees and charges. I'll hand directly over to Robin Gray, uh, Acting Finance Manager, to work through this report. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, welcome. Chair. Morning, councillors. Um, you'll remember on the 2nd and 3rd of February, we brought the draft fees and charges report to you for consideration. Uh, we've also had a council information session last week or the week before. Those changes, amendments have been updated in the documents that you've been presented today. The fees and charges are adopted prior to the annual budget each year, but Council has the option to amend any fees and charges at any time through the year under a, an adoption. So a report would come to you and you would have the choice then to adopt any changes that are necessary. Before we proceed to questions or to have this adopted, there's been some late changes that have been brought to my attention today. So if you go to page 114 of board books, towards the bottom, it's in the water section, items number three to six. Um, it's been requested that we remove the minimum charge of $20 for those four items. Um, the report that comes to the Ordinary Meeting of Council next week will have those $20 minimums removed. Are there That's any questions? lines three, four, five, five and six. And six? Yep. Yeah. Um, did you want to elaborate any further on that, Robin, or would we like the... Well, there's just been a, a late review of the um, information in the report, and it's been requested that they be removed. John Mills is here if anybody has any questions about it. Okay. Thank you. Robin, uh, Councillor Von Hoff. Yeah, thanks, um, uh, Chair. Through you to John, justification for why that decision um, has been requested. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Von Hoff. Perhaps uh, through um, General Manager or to uh, General Manager Platts or to John, whomever would like to. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, now, that fee was used uh, probably before our ride and stand pipe system. So if a, a water tracking company came up and got, you know, say, $5 worth of water, we would send them the invoice for $5 at the end of that particular uh, billing cycle. Uh, but now, with the use of the touch tag system, this fee you know, doesn't apply. They have their tag. They go and get X amount of water. But the fee was to cover, so we weren't, you know, writing invoices for five dollars, three dollars, that sort of stuff. But with the rollout of the new system, that uh, that fee is no longer necessary. Thank you. Thanks, John. Back to you, Robin. 
Are there any sorry, other sorry, Robin, before you go, it might <laughs> be another question. <laughs> Councillor, <laughs> Councillor Summerfield. Thank you. Could I just uh, ask, the, um, there was a discussion around the stamp pups, which I was unavailable for. I had to go to the conference. Um, I'm just wondering, are they reflected in, um, yes, in these fees? Yes, the last line of that page. So that same page there, yeah, the last line, well, all three, perhaps um, General Manager or John might might talk through just for the benefit of not only councils but those um, interested watching online. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the question, Councillor Summerfield. Yes, um, we, we left the slide pack there, so you would have gone through the slide pack, no doubt, and I won't go into that. But what we want to do was have a uniform price for uh, a potable for a standpipe in Toowoomba Bulk, a uniform price for raw water in Toowoomba Bulk, a uniform price in throughout the regions for both potable and um, uh, non-potable standpipe usage. And there was also some discussion about uh, uh, one particular standpipe which has not got some fees on it. We agreed to bring a council paper back through the currency of the next financial year and consider that for 20, what year are we? 2022, 20, 20. yep. which, which I greatly look forward to. Thank you. I've been wanting that for some time. So um, this is a, um, a story of interest, I think, to the community. So a media release will be done in due course after next Tuesday, will it? Or Yes, because it's, it's adjusting the price, particularly in the, in the southern system, in that Wairima one. Yeah. Um, it, and that will be a good news for the drought affected uh, residents that are relying on that and uh, you know the, the, it, it will help but the bulk of the the fee that goes into getting a, a truckload of water delivered to a property uh, is that freight on the truck and the driver and his time uh, not so much the water in 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 the truck but uh, every little bit helps during a drought uh, councillor Sean did you have a question on the same subject yeah just to clarify that one I I, uh, I take it that the uh, Fee was was or currently is about six dollars yes. or something like that, and the explanation that um, Damien has given uh, applies to the reduction down to four dollars twenty at Wairimo. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Thanks. Thank, <laughs> thanks, John. Thanks, Damien. Back to you, Robin. Are there any other questions, councillors? In, in that particular lot, or uh, did you have there any, were no other changes? Anything to do with fees and charges? Okay. No. There were no other changes. No. Councillors, any questions in regard to fees and charges? We had a fair session on it um, last week, I thought. No questions. If there are no questions in regard to the fees and charges, the recommendation is before you the attached register of fees and charges and the register of cost recovery fees and charges, the 2021-22 financial year be adopted by council with an effective date of 1 July 2021 and concluding a date of a subsequent council resolution varying the relevant fee of charge or charge and two, the council notes in adopting the register of fees and charges of the 21-22 financial year mentioned in one above that the card surcharge fee page one of attachment one is being reintroduced at 0.17%, which is a 50% subsidy of the standard charge of 0.33% as a continued response to COVID-19. Have some move that motion. Moved by Councillor O'Shea, seconded by Councillor Shine. Those in favour? The motion's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Councillors, we move then to item number three. Sorry, four, which is operational support for John Darian Woolshed. Uh, I'll hand directly to Acting GM Finance and Business Strategy, Anne Marie Johnson. Thanks, Anne Marie. Good morning again, councillors. So, the report that has been brought to you this morning is as a result of the deputation by the chair and the general manager of the John Darian Woolshed on the 17th of February. That report um, that was provided to councillors identified a large number of issues and raised raise concerns for safety of the community at the Jandarian Woolshed. The discussion that we've had since that time um, will help inform our budget deliberations for 2021-22 
And as we have discussed many times around this room, scarce resources. And at this point in time, the request from the Gendarian Woolshed was for $950,000 next year, so an increase of approximately 250000 So the recommendation that has, is being provided to you today, councillors, is to temporarily close the venue to allow council under um, project, property services to carry out an extensive review of buildings and site assessment, put together a plan to ensure the building is safe, to um, reallocate the budget from the operating budget to Jundarian Wiltshire Proprietary Limited to our property services and carry out a review of the options for the future of the facility. I know this is, um, this is a second um, recommendation there that's a temporary closure that we will work with the board, that um, we will agree on the respective roles and responsibilities and review the employment of the officers currently there and the management of prior bookings. So I have been working with property services regarding those prior bookings. We've received a full list from the woolshed and we would be happy to go through those with the various, um, with our community and ensure we can have a solution for all. Happy to take questions, councillors. And then uh, re recommend number, number, recommendation number three as well. Emery, you want to just... Yeah, that the board and council monitor and review the effect of the closure arrangements on the woolshed budget to determine the need for additional funding to be provided by council for the 2021 for the 2021 financial year. So that councillors was would be brought back to a budget review too, and that was request for additional sources and resources and approximately a hundred thousand dollars in funding. So that would be brought at budget review too. Thanks, Emery. Questions, Councillor Von Hoff. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Chair, if you'll indulge me, I have a number of questions. And I'm very mindful of the need to be careful with some of the um, confidential aspects that we have to navigate with this. So um, I'll do that with the utmost of care. Um, first question, through you, Chair, to the CEO, if I refer to the operating agreement, page 485 of board books, am I correct in saying that this operating agreement expired the 1st of March 2019, and if that's the case, what's been happening since then? My understanding was it was extended through till the end of December 2020. I was aware that, <coughs> um, became recently aware a week or two weeks ago, that uh, that, that period had expired and they hadn't approached us to renew it, so I actually have written back to the board extending that till I think it was June 30th this year. So that the, it is current at this point in time now, but I had to, I had to ensure that it was current and have extended that. Thank you. I'll, I'll be proposing a motion that speaks to that, um, that issue. My second question, we have got two observers on that board, um, Chair yourself and also um, you, Anne-Marie, and Again, I'm being very careful here with the confidentiality and I'm not gonna go into specifics. But we had um, a, the John Darien Woolshed had a total wages salary over the last 12 months of just over $600,000. And included in that is a functions coordinator and included in that is several, are several casual employees. And my question uh, to our two observers is, first of all, if you could please provide us councillors with your, um, with a, re a verbal report on the extent to which those board members have questioned a $600,000 wage bill over the course of a year when, first of all, the venue was closed because of workplace health and safety issues, and secondly, because it was closed in a global pandemic. Are those questions being asked by the board? 
I took over as board observer in January, from the end of January this year, so I haven't been to a board meeting as yet. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to, to Thanks, talk Jeff. to that, Councillor Vonhoff, if, if you like. Um, and the history of the closures um, back, dating back to 2017 when the interim board was put in place, and I note that, um, that Nick Hauser is in the room as well, so he might be able to add some context to this uh, as being a board member at that time. Uh, during the transition and, and, and the uh, extent of expense to the wool shed, not just through, um, through wages, was certainly a, a reason why, uh, why Council took the measure of, of having an interim board, which, was, uh, which we included Council officers and councillors. And uh, during that period of time, there was obviously a, a high level of scrutiny on what roles were there from an organisation chart. Um, what roles were needed, what the wool shed was about, and uh, if reference is given to the Stafford report, um, the actual um, the plan for that board was in line with the Stafford report, which was in 2015. Um, so we were acutely aware of, of the costs, and uh, the last 12 months, I think even through the deputation, we may well have heard the uh, reallocation of, of roles, reduction in staff numbers, um, so that the works that were identified through uh, workplace health and safety that council, the interim board, implemented with uh, council staff, and it was recognised through um, the Queensland Audit Office report, <coughs> was that um, for council to, um, to work through workplace agreements with staff, and uh, knowing full well that that, uh, that because it's a council-owned entity, there was no um, job keeper allocation available for the wool shed, um, that we also had an obligation from making sure that we worked on the workplace health and safety issues, of which there were some 200 issues, so, sorry, 400 issues identified, and some 40% of those have been achieved uh, to January this year. And they've largely been achieved because of the, um, the use of the staff that were there rather than getting others in, involved. Um, so the wage, even over the last 12 months, the, the average wage um, bill over a fortnight has uh, dropped almost by half um, over that period of time. So there has been certainly a, a conscious board decision and it's been followed through from the operational team to look at the overall expenses, who's there, who's not. The specifics around the person employed for an event uh, coordinator, <coughs> pardon me, that's in line, that was in line with a board decision uh, and it was presented in the deputation around a staged approach to reopen the facility. Stage one was uh, to open the wool shed proper, which was a venue for, for weddings and other functions. Um, that was stage one. So in order to open at stage one, uh, which was aligned with the views of this council at a deputation, um, to align um, the operation to that wish, the strategic view of the board, uh, obviously we needed someone then to, uh, to take calls, to monitor, to book people in. And um, Anne-Marie mentioned before, but there's some 28 um, whether it's a wedding or a function, they're booked between now and, and July of next year. So that person, although they haven't been holding functions until two weeks ago, it was the first wedding back, or three weeks ago now, um, has actually been busy formulating. And in fact, uh, one area that Council should be made aware of, and certainly as observers, um, it was brought to our attention. Council has previously been been reviewing this is the, the actual cost benefit of holding functions and events, weddings in the venue from a, from a cost perspective and, and identifying what the actual cost is for those. And it certainly was identified through the current uh, general manager that we were undercharging um, by and large and there was, there was uh, very little if no profit at all in the event. So um, that event manager has been reviewing all of those things and so much so that there, is, uh, there was a new package that was presented to the board uh, only at the last meeting um, to look at the, and the board actually ratified the new charges which are aligned with the uh, competitive nature of, of other venues but um, quite a change from what they were and the forecast therefore is that they will become profitable. So that, that person in particular that you raised has been working on that, that element of it. Have okay. I missed anything, Anne-Marie? No. 
Okay. Nick, is that your recollection? Oh, you knew that? Thank you for that comprehensive report, um, Chair. So is it fair to say that the board has, it is, is it correct to say that the board is comfortable with the wages bill of the last 12 months and the positions that have been kept on the books? Given the, the circumstances and, and all the prevailing uh, headwinds that uh, came our way, uh, the board has agreed uh, to, as we do, uh, well, as they do, at each meeting to make sure that the, uh, the John Darren Woolshed is solvent, can pay all of its debts, and, uh, and therefore is uh, was comfortable, as we do each each meeting, as they do each meeting, uh, look at the, the financials and give them circumstances. They agreed that uh, we were that the Woolshed was heading in the correct direction. Okay, thank you. My next question um, concerns repairs and maintenance. Now. Since 2013-14 financial year, Toowoomba Regional Council has contributed $125,000 per annum to John Darien for repairs and maintenance. And so that, that amount totals $1 million to date. Now, going through the financial statements, there are three figures attributed to repairs and maintenance. The first is in 2018, $37,565. In 2019, $42,486. In 2020, $40,035 to bring us to a total of $120,086. Now we've got, we've, we've given one million for repairs and maintenance, but the financial statements only account for $120,000 of that. And that is particularly striking to me given that the venue is closed or has been closed for uh, 12 months because of workplace health and safety concerns. Now, this was something that um, was raised with the Audit and Risk Committee and also with the Queensland um, Audit Office and the, the answers that I've personally received um, about that are unsatisfactory. To my mind, there's still that $879,000 that's unaccounted for. And the QAO, I think us councillors really have the um, understanding that the Queensland Audit Office goes through and reconciles all of the financial statements. But when this issue was raised with the QAO, um, I found their answer to be unsatisfactory. There was um, a, a comment made about the, that there was a one-page memo that dictated how that money was spent, and that's not the case. We actually albeit expired, have an operating agreement with the Woolshed. And, and we have to remember that these are public funds. And we've always, I mean, I've only been around this, this, this chair, this table for one year, but we've always justified the money that we give to John Darien because of the social benefit, the social, the social license that comes with that. And it's really hard to justify social benefit and social license when a, a venue that is funded with public funds is closed to the public. And I remind councillors that since 2010-11, Toowoomba Regional Council has, has given John Darien just over $9 million. And if we take, there was a 2016 donation of assets from Toowoomba Regional Council of $1,200,014, which QAO has ordered back onto our books at the 30th of June, 2020. So I'm not satisfied that I understand where another $870,000 that was supposed to be spent on repairs and maintenance has been spent. And um, so my question through you, Chair, to Anne-Marie is 
having raised this with the Audit and Risk Committee and also having um, raised this with the QAO and been unsatisfied with the, with the responses received, what is the next step so that councillors can be confident that that $800 plus thousand dollars has been spent as intended on repairs and maintenance at John Derry and Woolshed? Thank you for the question. Um, Councillor, I agree um, with everything you've said in relation to the 125000 a year. Back when Council made that decision to approve 125000 for repairs and maintenance at the Woolshed, there was um, a lot of discussion around the table about whether that 125000 would sit in property services budget in TRC or whether it would go to the Woolshed. And the decision was made in the end that it would go directly to the wool shed to be spent on the repairs and maintenance. And we've seen the outcome from that decision. And that is why mm. um, that recommendation is being made, as it has been made today, to move the funds to property services, to appoint a project manager to ensure these workplace health and safety issues are addressed immediately. Thank you. That's, that's going forward, but retro retroactively. Mm. To be, okay, I can address that with a motion. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the final question that I have, um, and I thank the chair again for his indulgence, is, as I said, this was raised as is appropriate with our audit and risk committee. And, and I'm going to be very careful here with what I, I say, um, and I'm not going to be specific, but this council was made aware of a particular allegation that under the Local Government Act, we have a duty to notify the Triple C. And there was no recommendation that came from the Audit and Risk Committee to this council to, to report that to the Triple C. Now, the Audit and Risk Committee's responsibilities, again under the Local Government Act, is to monitor the integrity of financial documents and also to make recommendations to Council about any matters that they consider need action or improvement. And so, using logic, the only two outcomes there are that they the Audit and Risk Committee did not believe that that allegation needed to be referred to the Triple C or that they failed to recognise the risk and decided against making a recommendation to Council. And I think that is profoundly concerning to me as a councillor and, and Again, I'll be putting forward a recommendation um, to address that. But I remind councillors that we have a duty to notify here. This isn't a grey area. This is, this is um, our responsibility as elected members. I'll just hand over, thanks Councillor Vaughan, I'll hand over to the CEO to make comment. Um, council does have a responsibility, as do I, if, where there's um, allegations of impropriety or whatever it may be um, and in, in that particular case my understanding is there was a comment made that indicated certain things had or had not been had not been done um, following that audit committee meeting we actually asked questions from the person who where those um, where that had purportedly or allegations had come from that the actual facts would not be able to be substantiated when we asked those questions to a point where we could actually form a reasonable s suspicion that we had any obligation to refer it to the, uh, the Triple C. So if there's any um, proof that we actually have, and there is nothing forthcoming or available at this stage, it's hearsay, if there is anything there, we will um, make that referral, but we actually have followed that up and we have an obligation to do that um, I, I don't think that the, the audit committee had an, had an obligation to refer that because they had no fact. Um, they had a comment, but they didn't have any fact. Um, and I, I took that up uh, 
through part of my role to actually chase that down to see if there's any substantiating evidence that would make a reasonable um, belief that there was some action that we, uh, some in, inappropriate conduct or action that had to be referred to the Triple C. At this stage, I haven't had anything um, forthcoming. Thank you. Supplementary then, um, Chair, through you to the CEO. Upon, <coughs> me. upon what um, legislative advice are you acting where you believe that reporting uh, the duty to notify is dependent on a reasonable s suspicion? What we have to do is have some evidence to, to, in order to have that belief. So there, is, there was no evidence from the person that it was purported made those claims that they could produce. So a, a, a comment made to all councillors in an, is not considered evidence? Someone and I'm, ask, make, I'm asking because we, it's a very serious um, responsibility that we all have as, for, to, uh, as a duty to notify. Somebody, somebody um, can make a comment, but you need evidence uh, to support such a comment, and there, is, there was no evidence that actually supported those comments. When, when we actually put a direct question about asking time states and whatever it might be, there was, the, there was um, no response that we could actually follow up on. Okay, thank you, CEO. So I guess the question for us councillors is, are we comfortable discharging our responsibility um, with that advice provided by you? But we'll, um, there's lots of questions and I've got motions um, to put forward, but I'll come back after some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Von Hoff. I might just pick up, if you don't mind, on the third question around repairs and maintenance, the $125,000. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it, it's probably highlighted um, what's been a deficiency in, uh, or I, I guess a, a, a divergence of volunteerism um, through the woolshed. The first of which was the Westbrook Correctional Centre, uh, where it was estimated around about 30 hours per week and the second of which is um, general volunteers, which is around 180 hours a week. So 210 hours a week of volunteerism, which, um, you know, if you, you extrapolate that out, it's around a quarter of a million dollars of volunteerism that, that the woolshed wasn't receiving. And therefore, and I think that would have been part of the deputation, was around uh, the correctional centre more so than the broader volunteerism. Um, but I think it's fair to say that um, Lots of these similar like-minded organisations have, have the same issue in regard to volunteerism and, and uh, as a community we do a, a pretty good job right across our region but the woolshed has been one of those areas that um, there's volunteer groups there like the, the windmills do a great job, the, the, uh, the workshed with the old machinery, the trains uh, who incidentally are opening a, a shade shelter over the, the track today where you get on and off the train. Uh, that's actually happening today, a grant through a New Hope group, uh, the beekeepers and the general yard maintenance. Uh, but that aside, there was uh, a significant downfall in volunteers. So perhaps the operating agreement didn't reflect um, all of those details and the $125 that was earmarked for repairs and maintenance actually was going to keep the operation uh, open. And I think if, if between now and next week we can get um, justification of that, that may help um, justify why that is. But certainly the $244,000 for the drought uh, funding that's gone to the wool shed now, which has to be spent before June 30, uh, is an indicator that you know, we need that money to do the works. So that's the, federal, issue. that's the federal government funding you're referring that's right. to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Nancy. Uh, thanks, Councillor Jeff. Could you just explain to me how um, the volunteering um, has what it's got to do with the spend of $125,000 each year. I mean, the volunteering is free. Uh, they're given the opportunity to be given whatever building materials or paint or whatever required to do maintenance, mm. uh, but that spend has not occurred to for that to happen. So if the volunteers aren't there, wouldn't they then employ uh, mm. professionals to come and do that work and spend their $125,000 each year? 
Yeah, that's that's 100 percent correct, and that's where the cost is going to. But they're not doing repairs and maintenance. They're actually doing the operations of the, the whether it's the the whip cracker or the whatever it might be. It's going towards the general operation. So, uh, which means that the volunteerism, which if you don't have the volunteers, you've got to pay for it, and and that's where it was. The volunteers may have been the whip crackers or may have been the whatever they are, and unfortunately they don't have the the time to do that as volunteers. They they want to be paid for it, and and that's where uh, a lot of that. Um, effort, but we'll clarify that during the week, but where a lot of that effort would have gone to. So the operating agreement was probably uh, out of touch with the, the current situation. Was that the only question you had though? Because you, you had your hand up earlier, Nancy, no? Mm. Okay. Councillor Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, well, just following on from the comment from um, Councillor Summerfield and a comment that you yourself, Chair, made a little bit earlier. If if volunteerism or volunteers hours are decreased and then money, that 125,000 which is allocated to WHS is being spent to keep the operating operations of the business going, well, to me, that means that the facility is not able to pay its debts when ready or, or when called for because if you're spending money on keeping the operation afloat and you're not spending money on yeah. WHS, then that means the facility is not operating optimally well, that, and, and can't that's, pay its to, debts. That, that's been the argument that I think every deputation that, that's right. come this way to council and but, hence to say uh, the last 12 months the wages, the expenses that's yeah. through COVID naturally have, have reduced significantly. Well, that then goes back to the wages bill of $600,000 when it was said that the board was comfortable with that expenditure on wages because the facility could pay all debts when due. So to That's me right. that doesn't align very mm. well. Mm. Because if, if, if you need that $125,000 that was supposed to be for repairs and maintenance is being spent on the operating operation of the facility and the board was comfortable with $600,000 of wages, that doesn't align Well, to me. The, the $125,000 was earmarked for repairs and maintenance, and unfortunately, because of lack of, and we can clarify this, as I've said, this is the third time, because there has been uh, less people out there to volunteer and do the, the works around the gardens and what have you, uh, people have been employed to do that. So um, somewhere that's, that's got to be paid for. And, and I do believe that, that deputations have been had here um, talking about that very issue. And in fact, the forecast for the operations of that organisation, albeit preliminary forecasts, is close to a million dollars. So that's where this motion gives us a chance to actually reset the But the whole if there thing. were no events happening and it was closed down for mm -hmm. Ma repairs and maintenance that was closed because of pandemic, then there, were, there was no need for the whip cracker or the train master or whoever else was required for events because there were no events. So this is what I'm trying to reconcile because to me, it's not reconciling. Well, if you, if you look at the wage you spend from this time last year to what they are now and the numbers of people employed, you'll see a significant decrease. Yes, but not 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 significant enough that they're now coming back and asking for more money. And there's 175,000 outstanding for repairs and maintenance that we can't reconcile. Well, I think that's where the recommendation today will hopefully going um, forward allow us to look at all of those things. To be fair, Councillor thank Carroll. you, Mr. Chair. I've mentioned it many times. Um, we just seem to take as read that all those buildings out there need to be fixed up. I mm. think we need to check whether they're essential to the running of the wall shed before we start spreading the money too thin. But I do need to make a uh, comment here. Uh, the previous board was really criticised, and uh, and there was a lot of um, uh, criticism levelled at them and the way the place was running and. Um, and I actually uh, used to go out there a lot and I thought it was running quite well. Now, there was a lot of innuendo and whatever else about the way they were operating out there. Uh, we've changed all that and now there's, and, and I, this is pre-COVID. There's, no, there's been no improvement. 
So I, I, I actually, you know, I, I really don't know uh, what all that was about. And, um, you know, at least you used to be able to go and get a cup of coffee or something out there. Now, now you can't. Mm. And uh, I just, we spend more time having the facility closed than we do having it open. And this is not just COVID. This mm. is many things. And I will say again that the community out there have not been informed or engaged on what's happening. And many of those actually are and have been volunteers. Okay. So, I mean, we, you know, it's almost like um, we're just going to get the money and uh, we don't need to do, um, engage the volunteers and do what we're able to do. There are volunteers out there. I'm, I'm assured, I don't know, but I'm assured that there are and that some of them have the skills to assist with some of these things, but they have not been engaged. We'll take that on as a, as a comment, if, if you don't mind. Councillor Tim, you had a question? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah. Just a couple <coughs> quick ones. Um, I, I share Melissa's point of view, Councillor Melissa, that you know, the grants are for the next big thing, not necessarily the operational uh, funding of staff, and, and there are a few gaps there looking back. But I, um, I note the recommendation is, well, we, we had a, an information session from these guys, and our recommendation is very different to what they suggested our recommendation should be. Um, have we, and I know you're, you're, you're on in some capacity, Chair, but have we told the board that this is what we're thinking of putting up, or did they see it on Friday when these went public? So in, in answer to that, um, no. So the board have been informed. We've been working with the board to get the information that has been provided to councillors over the last couple of days. Um, there are three options in the report that the um, board provided, but the fourth option is one that council is recommending. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Last question. Yeah, thanks for that answer. I just didn't want them to drop the bombshell, you know, from this. Um, we have a lot of um, much-loved uh, parts in that, like the beekeeping in the trains, etc. And uh, if we were to go with the recommendation, which is a temporary close, um, is there is there option in in moving those to other parks or other areas around Toowoomba region that have already been explored, or would that have to come after this? Just thinking that those people who do volunteer and have their their little piece of the world that they do really well, um, is there any way we can we can sort of help them and put these in other places, or has that conversation not been had yet? No, that will all be part of the process and the review. So it's, it's virtually covered off in number two. And just to be clear, the, the centre has only just reopened for that stage one of the events on the 20th of January, I think was the, the first event, February, 20th February. of February. Um, so it, it effectively is closed and only, only open for those events. So the volunteers have been out there. As I said earlier, the, the trained people have been working on their track and toiling a way to get that, that ready for when or if the, the facility reopens in full. Um, the beekeepers haven't been out there as much, but the, uh, certainly the windmills and the, um, and the guys in the shed and what have you have certainly been very active. So I think that covers off in item number two in regard to that. Um, does that satisfy you? Councilor yeah, McMahon. yeah, thanks, Chair. I, I did have a very good conversation with his name escapes me, who runs the train, and he was certainly uh, very keen for the reopening, and, and now it's um, well, certainly not going to happen in the next little while. So um, as long as we're working with those yeah. individuals, I think for the answer. Yeah. Councillor Megan? Oh, sorry, Bill. Yeah. Um, Anne-Marie, a question to you, I think. Um, you made mention, oh, oh, well, um, in an email you talked about the Stafford reports and Councillor MacDonald um, referred to that before. Can you just explain what that, what they were? Yes, so Council commissioned a report in 2009 for best practice operations of the venue and with, with the, of the facilities and with various options. So that, was, that report was... Um, commissioned to inform the board and assist the board in their, with their role. Right. And so were those recommendations adopted or, um, and employed? The report was provided to the, to the board. Mm. Yeah. It, it went through, I think 2009 was the first one. There's some councils around the table. And 2015, there was the revised one, which is documented here. And uh, it's very much aligned with the similar views of 
conversations we've had in, in the room, which was around preserving the history, um, you know, opening up for functions, weddings, etc., and accommodation. They were the, the three highlights, and that hasn't changed from then to now. Now, this would give us an opportunity to re-prosecute that. Um, certainly the Education Department is very keen to, to talk through opportunities for, uh, for the Woolshed facility for, for certain activities they could do. So, you know, there's, there's other things that can happen, but this recommendation actually allows for all of those conversations to happen. Councillor Carl. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And I recall also having sat around the table and objected to the report initially that came to us um, as I had the view that it was unsustainable. Um, one of those options was mothballing the centre as well. But my question specifically, um, and it may be in the body of the report, I may have overlooked it, in the first point A of the recommendation carry out a detailed building and safety assessment which will inform council of the funding required to bring the facility to a safe and operational standard. Do we have some quantum of what that will take, that audit, I guess? Not at this stage. So we have had a building assessor on site and a workplace health and safety officer. So in the interim board were appointed in 2017, council provided extensive resourcing around um, workplace health and safety, building assessors, um, HR support to review the operations and to ensure that we brought them um, into line as, as best we could. And I know that from February till August last year, we had a work Place health and safety officer on site reviewing. So there's been, I mean, that, that will all be part of, it would be interesting to know how much additional money will be thrown at it for that function alone. Um, I take it that that will be taking out, taken out of the, the normal allocation that we give to yes. the wool shed? And, so that, and that is the, um, the recommendation? Yeah. So I'm just... Sorry, um, for the count property services. So yes. B, yeah. so point B, one yeah. B there. Yep, it'd be just interesting to know what that would come out at because it's not as though this has been in my my recollection of the, this long history. Um, it's not as though it's been the only audit that's been carried out. It'd, it'd be nice to know an accumulated amount of spent on assessing conditions of buildings, and a comment was made that's here before that. about assuming that everything needs to be uh, repaired, replaced or brought up to standard, safety standards, um, has been viewed through a particular prism that I've struggled with for many years. Um, anyway, so is there any way of us finding out, you know, if this recommendation gets up, any way of us having some quantum of what that is before we even get off the mark to whether we decide what we're gonna do. At this point in time, we have the $670,000 in the proposed budget for next year. So as part of the budget deliberations, we will be bringing that figure back to you. So where that sits, whether it sits as a community service obligation to the proprietary limited company or whether it sits in um, property services, the request that came through the deputation was for an additional 250,000 plus um, repairs and maintenance. So in that deputation, I think it was $600,000 for maintenance and one million in lead paint um, repair work. So they're quite significant dollars that were um, put around the room. And as you know, we're currently reviewing size and shape of the organization, the services we are delivering. The budget will be a difficult budget to, to balance with, without um, these other factors. So. Mm -hmm by handing the project over to property services allows us to take a measured approach to ensure the resources are there to fully inform mm. this board of what's required. I look forward to that because on average, it's about a, a, at least a 1% uh, equivalent of a, in the general rate, keep That's this correct. operating. Mm. Um, so we, it'd be really nice. Thanks, Councillor Carl. Councillor Vonhoff and Councillor Summerfield and Councillor Carroll. 
Oh, thanks. Uh, well, I'll wait, actually, because I, um, I was going to propose some amendments. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, well, if that's what, okay, I'll go for it then. So, Wendy, you've got um, all of the, those seven that I sent to you. Before you just put up the last one, though, um, before you put it up there, can we just change the wording slightly? Um, so this is in addition to the, the recommendations. So it's not instead of, it's in addition to. So just before you put up that council immediately refers. Sorry? So, okay, so if, if um, we've got the three recommendations up there, so if in addition to those three, we can put um, numbers one, two, three, four, five that I sent, please, Wendy, and then before you put that last one, can we just change the wording, but also put it up, that council immediately refers allegations pertaining to documents at John Derry and Woolshed to the Crime and Corruption Commission and that councillors be informed of the outcome of the referral of allegations, full stop. But the rest go unchanged, thanks. That the oh, final one, you mean? Seven. The final one? Yep. That council immediately refers allegations pertaining to documents at John Derry and Woolshed to the Crime and Corruption Commission and that council has been informed of the outcome, if appropriate, mm. if appropriate, of the referral. And I can talk through each of those when they appear. Put that up on the screen. Yeah, yeah, because then I can speak through them, um, and then I, there may be questions from councillors. Thanks. Yeah. So it's in addition to the ref, um, recommendation that was put before us. The first uh, proposed amendment speaks to that question of the $879,914 that's unattributed to repairs and maintenance. And um, Councillor MacDonald, I, I, um, I don't see the relevance of the, the contribution made of the um, volunteers because this is really, this is just about financial statements. This is black and white. And in those financial statements, there's no, there's no accounting for close to $880,000 of public funds. That's the first. The second one that I've proposed is that councillors be provided with a full account of the lapsed operating agreement and considers policies for all council-owned entities to ensure that those agreements are regularly reviewed and current. And the reason for that is that I, I, so that we don't find ourselves in a situation again with another wholly owned entity where we have a lapsed operating agreement 
I don't know what, what happened there, but that, that shouldn't have happened and we need to make sure that those are current. Um, the third is that we reconsider the draft budget for 21-22 of $950,000, which I believe is an increase of 37%. And the reason, um, my reason for that really speaks to my discomfort with the financial management that I've seen um, in, the, in the documents that I've looked at. The next one, that council writes to the Queensland Audit Office expressing concern that council's audit and risk committee was not provided with compre comprehensive answers or a commitment to undertake further inquiries in relation to the $879,914 unaccounted for in financial statements pertaining to repairs and maintenance at John Deere and Woolshed, an expired operating agreement and staff records. The next that council writes to our audit and risk committee reminding them of their responsibility to monitor the, integ the integrity of financial documents and make recommendations to council about matters they consider need action or improvement. And finally, that we refer that allegation to the Triple C because I'm not satisfied that I and we can discharge our responsibilities and our duty to notify based on the comments of the CEO. We'll go, if you're happy with that, we'll move to questions yeah. before we, we have a seconder on that because there's a fair bit, fair bit in that to unpack probably. Yeah. Councillor Carl. Yeah, just cl some clarity from whoever, maybe through you, Chair, to the CEO. I'm just wondering whether it would go to the Triple C first, <coughs> um, given that um, and, and there's two questions here, I guess. The timing of that allegation as to the timing of when the Office of the Independent Assessor was created or formed. Um, my understanding is we have a duty to report regardless of facts established. That's for the Office of the Independent Assessor to establish if there's a case or not and where it gets referred, whether it comes back to council whether it goes to the tribunal or whether it goes to the triple C. So I'm just, without knowing the details of that, and if, if there has to be some confidential discussion at a later date around that, then I'm happy, but I'm just asking a procedural question. I think there's some confusion between the Office of the Independent Assessor, that's a body that looks after complaints so, about council laws. Sorry? There's confusion <coughs> about the Office of the Independent Assessor, which is a a, a agency that looks after complaints about Twimber, uh, sorry about council laws throughout the state. It has no responsibility at all in relation to this one. This is the triple C. Oh, so that's the name. Yes, it's this a, is the triple C. The allegations are and about. And we'd ask the questions about uh, because it's not a, it's a statutory uh, sorry the it's an entity owned by council. What what um, legislation it falls under? And they said in. If those allegations had any substance, then you would refer those to the Triple C, right? And then they would advise what action needed okay. to be taken. So, so that's there's the, been that's, some that's direction. That's the process. That's right. Okay. Thank you. And through you, Chair, I just might add to that: the allegations that were made have been discussed by. So they were handed over by the CEO to Governance and Legal Services, who handed the matters directly to the Triple C for review and a list of questions came back to substantiate and they were unable to be addressed. So I am aware that governance and legal services are in discussion with the Triple C in relation to these matters. Is that happening so, now? Sorry, yes, uh, Mr Chair, is that actually happening now? It is, yes. So then that can be, then that being the case, that final recommendation can be altered to read that council Council laws be informed of the outcome of the referral of uh, of allegations, if appropriate, and the if appropriate is in there because yes. potentially there's going to be issues that it is not appropriate for for councillors to be informed of. Okay, that's a good question. Um, any other questions in regard to the motions put forward? 
yeah, add to the triple yeah. C. That's a good idea. Sorry, can I just make a comment there? Because if we um, we just leave that like that, it might mean the board or something else. Um, should we put in there what it's about? I don't I some, think, I think something because that casts a wide net that could. Um, I think if um, I can, my reason for being very cautious with the wording, Councillor Taylor, was that if um, any further detail might identify individuals and then that, that we could be entering some difficult legal areas. I think that if there was, um, I think that it would organically be fed back to the board. Councillor Antonio, then Councillor O'Shea. We're just still on questions here. Can I ask uh, through you, Mr Chair, oh. if the board is aware of what's happening at this point in time and they've had an opportunity to uh, respond in any way? Because this will, imagine, have very serious implications for them. Uh, well, obviously, for the first three motions they are, are aware of. Um, the motions put forward by Councillor Von Hoff they aren't aware of. It's just come to the table today, um, most of which um, could, in fact, be answered between now and next Tuesday. To be perfectly honest, um, in fact, uh, number five, Councillor Von Hoff, I'm not sure you know, when you say full account of John Darren Woolshed's lapse of operating agreement, how much more detail is required by the CEO in regard to that? Um, well, I can. Uh, I'll answer, um, Chair. You know, this is lar These are large sums of money that we that we distribute to our wholly owned entities. And it's, it's, we all are very aware it's ratepayers' money. And how we, what are the mechanisms that we control to make sure that that money is spent appropriately and with the intent of this council? There's only two ways. It's either through an operating agreement or it's through resolution of this council. And how is it that we had an operating agreement that lapsed and we didn't know about it until some of these questions were raised. And I mean, I would have thought that that exposes council to a high degree of risk and that we need to figure out how that happened and what needs to be done differently in the future so that it doesn't happen again and it doesn't happen with our other wholly owned entities. Don't, don't disagree with, with any of that. I'm just wondering how much more detail the CEO can provide in, in regard to that particular motion. Well, I'd say, what, what, what processes do we have in place? Yeah. What processes do we have in place to, to review those operating agreements? And, and, and I could go further with that, but I'll, I won't. Well, you recall, Councillor Vonoff, in the deputation from the wool shed that the operating agreement was mentioned to being reviewed. The Empire Theatres and other wholly owned subsidiaries is, has also had extensions on theirs. So I'm um, happy for the CEO to comment. I just don't know how much more detail we can get. Brian, you might add to that. Yeah. Uh, Council, there's a policy being developed, a new policy on um, the interaction with the, with the uh, council owned entities that's gone out for consultation to the actual entities uh, at the moment and that it will be back subject to a report probably in the next month so it's very close for a, for a review of that policy document to come back to council and okay so through you chair um, to the ceo does that policy document address the concerns that i've raised here that we could potentially have lapsed operating agreements unbeknownst to us and if it does, I'm happy to withdraw it, to it, it take that. It should address that, but if, okay. it, if it doesn't, I'll make sure it does. But I'm pretty sure it does. I'm, 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 if it's redundant, if it's a redundant um, amendment, I'm happy for it to be removed. Yeah. If if you're saying that there's already policy work being undertaken there that's is. going to address that concern, that's so in right. that case, whatever item it is, number five, I'm happy for that to be removed. Yeah, Councillor O'Shea, did you have your hand? No, you were just highlighting the the mayor, uh, <laughs> Councillor McMahon. Oh, thanks, Chair. I'm just wondering, um, through you to Councillor Vonhoff, number five, you want us to reconsider the draft budget for 
just wondering uh, if or how that contradicts with number one that is already a motion where we're reallocating mm. the annual operating budget back to council anyway. I just want some they're clarification. Yeah, they're, they're different financial years, Councillor McMahon. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Thanks. Just following up on that item, what number? Item number five now. Um, um, we actually, even the draft budget for the wool shed, the board hasn't, the board hasn't actually voted on the budget. That was just a, a comment that was made, I think, in here or a report from the general manager. So that's that hasn't even got to that stage yet. Um, so there's really nothing to consider. So I'm actually um, a bit confused with that one. Sorry. So the 21-22 draft budget. So in recommendation one, sorry Wendy, if you can go back to recommendation one, reallocate the annual operating budget. So that is for 21-22. Mm. That would be the, the standard operating budget of six, whatever it was, 650. Yeah, I'm just a bit confused as to what so we're trying to... I'll, I'll refer to page 307 of board books, councillors, six of six of the report. Financial resource implications, the second paragraph there. The draft budget for 21-22 is estimated at 950,000, an increase of 37% from current total community service obligations of 691,000 with additional human resources also requested. That's where that comes from. Yes, so in the recommendation, um, recommendation 1B, I'm rec recommending that that 950,000 be moved to property services. Yeah. That's, that's Sorry, so it's from, but that, that's for 2122, um, Anne Marie, not. Yeah, our so current. 1B, that we reallocate the annual operating budget. So after that, perhaps for 2122, or after the Jim Darwin will shed for 2122. So for effective from 1 July this year. Mm. For 2122. So yeah. can I just follow up? My question was that yeah. that yes. isn't one year, that's for good as written. No, temporary close. No, 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 Tempor but we, we're reallocating it like it doesn't mm. have just this year on it. I, I don't agree that they're different. Yeah, anyway, it's clarified now. So with the addition of that 21, with 22. The, yeah, comfortable, that's clear. And, and keeping in mind that draft is only a draft budget, that 950. Oh, well, I, I have not. All I've saw was approved, the, yeah. present, the presentation. Yeah. So that, that would be a budget consideration in any regard, you know, but that's... That's the intent of this motion, is to say that. Uh, Councillor Antonio? Look, I attempted to find out before if the board were, were aware of the referral. Are the board members yes. aware of the referral? Yes, they are. Okay, thank you. I okay. actually had a phone call from a board member yesterday uh, challenging the figures in the report, in this report. So, Specifically the 950,000. Just uh, through you, Chair, to um, answer um, Councillor McMahon's question. Um, <coughs> 691,000, the current obligation, 691. Is that 2020-21? That's this current financial year. Yes. <coughs> So what, what um, the general manager has added 21-22 is for the next financial year. Um, however, it may be restrictive to say the annual budget for general which it goes to property services because it depends on what happens in number three when council and the board Precise. discuss. Precisely. I think that it's going. we are going to have to have a conversation about um, how comfortable we are and how appropriate we think it is to spend money at John Derry and Woolshed. So the intent of putting um, that 950, reconsidering the 950,000 was that there's a mechanism for us councillors to, to reconsider potentially if we, if we give any more money to, to the Woolshed. That said, if it is addressed in 1B, then five becomes redundant. Is that correct? Through you, Chair, to Anne-Marie? That's correct. So we can delete five. And so, um, Councillor, um, page four of six of the report, or page th um, 305, 
that's where the 691,000 comes from for the current year. Mm -hmm. And there was a request at the deputation for another 100,000. Can we just go back to the motions, please, Wendy, right, on the screen? Desire. Put forward by Councillor Vonhoff. Councillor Ahara Sullivan. Thanks, Mr Chair. Um, my question and I guess the inference around the um, where the 879,000 that has not been allocated to uh, repairs and ma maintenance. Councillor Macdonald, you said before there might um, be a chance between now and um, the ordinary meeting about an, a credible explanation about that. And Anne-Marie has just said about um, a board member questioning some of those figures. I mean, I'm just really sort of confused about this process and what the um, you know what the explanations are, I guess. Well, th this motion will will help just clarify those, as as I understand it. That's the intent of the motion. Yeah. So bottom. it's you know perhaps the explanation. There's no inference at this stage, um, Councillor O'Hara Sullivan. Perhaps the explanation will be that we changed our reporting standards in 2018 and prior to that they weren't included in our financial state my, our annual financial statements but here here are the invoices for that $879,000 perhaps that's perhaps that's the answer but we just I, I feel that we just as custodians of the public purse we need to understand we said it was going to repairs and maintenance so Let's see that it went to repairs and maintenance. So there's nothing. Yeah, that's. It's not a you, you don't have any. I don't have an issue with that motion that's in there. No one else. Then. So, is there any other questions in regard to the motions put forward? Councillor Nancy. Thank you. I do. Do you have a seconder for it yet? No, we haven't. No. Well, because there were so many new motions today, I wanted to go for questions at this, at this stage. And in fact, there's not even a mover for it. There's just a motion being put forward to the table to discuss. So I'm happy to, if you want to, have to move into, into formalising it, I'm happy to, but I just wanted to give everyone a chance to ask some questions. And uh, sorry, I thought Councillor Rebecca had moved. Well, uh, no, no. So I did want to talk about um, the future. Um, and I go back to what Councillor Carroll was saying before about the buildings. We do need to assess what buildings really need to be there and what don't, what should go to reduce our costs. Um, we talk about the changes that we've already made, thinking that that was going to make things better, and it really hasn't, uh, based on what we're seeing you know, in the, in the uh, things that have been reported, re provided to us in this report. Um, and for me, moving forward, I want to see us have a fresh page because we can't just keep throwing money at this facility and thinking it's all going to be OK, because obviously it's not. Um, I do believe it needs to be shut down for a, quite a period of time and to just fix the buildings that need to be fixed mm, agree. Um, and see where we land from there. Um, I don't want to see a heap of money given to, say, property services to then turn around mm. and not necessarily get the outcomes that we need either. I believe we need, as a council, to sit down and workshop this with the appropriate staff out on site so that we actually know what's really going on here and try and get a fresh start with fresh eyes to deliver whatever we end up delivering. And it may just be that we deliver a wool shed, or it may just be that we deliver an events um, <coughs> function centre, which is one of the pros in that Stafford report. Mm. That was the focus of, of what they were saying, was that it should become a function centre and forget about the shearing, and et cetera, if you want to get some sort of money back into it. But what we've done <coughs> hasn't worked, and I want to see a fresh start so that something does work finally for the community at some stage. And I think we need to limit the amount of money that we actually provide each year to try and bring it back up to that standard, whatever that is that we decide as a council it should be, and move forward. So, Councillor Summerfield, just picking up on that, um, the only thing, by the sounds of it, in the recommendation that you're contrary to is, is the operating budget going to property services. 
with which Adam. is one well, no, B. that we review how much that is when we do the budget, but, but prior to us reviewing how much that is, when we need to actually go out there and, and think about and have an assessment of those buildings to see which ones should stay and which ones should go. Absolutely. So well, I, an on-site visit is imperative, I get that, but I just yes. wondered what's different to what's actually in the recommendations to to possibly the outcome that we'll, we'll get by doing exactly what you've said. I wasn't suggesting that there needed to be an amendment. I'm just saying okay. that my Thanks. view moving forward has to be different to what we've been always been doing and yep. expecting something different. No, I don't think you'll get any disagreement there. Councillor Von Hoff. Um, thanks, Chair. Through you to Councillor Summerfield. Councillor Summerfield, I think that there would be um, support for exactly what you're saying yeah. and um, that perhaps that can be addressed by adding some words to 1B, which, are, which would be something like, because 1A is that we carry out this um, assessment, so that's going to be the audit of all of the buildings. And um, then B, that councillors consider the outcomes of the assessment in 1A. Um, and the potential to or something like that because then it's it's not a given that we're going to spend the entire the entire budget it, because we might have that assessment done and they say keep that that one goes keep that that one goes and okay. the the God. budget becomes greatly reduced mm. i don't know mm. we might just if you don't mind councillor von Hoff, i'll go to the ceo it might help with a bit of wording there yep. if you, you've got to read um recommendation one and recommendation two together. The first one talks about its council's preferred position to temporarily close facilities to achieve certain things. I would suggest, I'll just ask Wendy to get a second, um, if you replace that B into there. Uh, this knows that B there again, so instead of that B there. A loop. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and if you actually look at the recommendation underneath, um, there's some negotiations that has to happen with the board, and also you've got to remember that the employees are employed by the John Derry and Woolshed board, not by council. Therefore, they're going to need some residual funds, to, no matter what the arrangement is, to actually, um, de depending on how many staff they keep, it, all of that. Um, but they would most likely continue to probably pay the staff for a period of time or whatever is it finally agreed. So with that in mind, I suggest perhaps you consider mm -hmm. that new B there, which was, so it's council's, um, council's position is to temporarily close community access to the John Drayton Wool Shed facilities to A and then to B, to reallocate as much of the annual John Derry and Woolshed budget as possible to Council's Property Services Branch to project manage <coughs> the required maintenance works. I just I don't think that that adequately addresses um, what we're saying about we need to we need to have a conversation all of us councillors about what how comfortable we are with the required maintenance works. There just needs to be another loop back to us. In, yeah. Because, so, you know, Councillor Taylor has spoken a lot about we need to do this audit and uh, consider all of the buildings and there should be a punctuation mark after that audit that comes back to Council before there's a release of funds. Yeah. So, can I make a comment? There's nothing there that says there's going to be an audit. It just says detailed building and safety assessment. Well, it doesn't. No. They can just fix it. Just let the CEO talk. Just but, so note that in his mind for the moment. Councillor Carroll and Councillor Melissa. Okay. Councillor Carroll? Well, I was just yes. going to say the CEO is quite right. There's animals and things out there that need to be looked after. 
So, I mean, that's a, the, the very little of the budget's gone on that, if you have a look at it. Mm. But there's animals that need to be looked after through the, through the process here. So we can't just cut everything out of, the, out of, out of it. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that the, the draft horses and things like that, they need to stay there, they're part of it, unless you decide to close it. So I think that needs to be, there seems to be a certain amount of money left there to look after those, uh, those animals that are out there. Well, I actually think two... 2B could deal with that, and, and that's where it needs to sort of come back to council uh, following, you know, uh, the idea for the, from the board to say, well, what is, what's different to what we're asking them to do through this motion to what they're actually currently doing? Because they are closed, they're open for weddings and functions, of which they've got 28 booked in till the middle of next year. So what is different to what we're doing? That's my question going in my mind, and, and maybe the board needs to talk with council about how we can mitigate those events or whatever, whatever there might be. Um, so Councillor Melissa. Thank you, Chair. Um, my, I just wanted to make a comment going back to what we were just talking about with A and B. I think it's really important that the assessment slash audit, whatever we deem to call it, is done first before we look at the, mm. the allocation of funds because yep. it might be too extensive to even go forward. So we actually need to make sure that yep. that's done mm. first yep. and the, the recommendation needs to reflect that we then have, we as council have the ability to not allocate any funds right. because it might be too expensive to go forward and then it's just a, you know, we're pouring good money after bad. So I think that's really important. And so I wanted to make that comment. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good then. point. That's so there's, there's one, the councillors consider the outcomes of assessment 1A. So that's, that's where we were sort yeah, of heading right. towards, weren't we, yeah, as well, B? Right. I was just trying to make comment before. So I, I guess the question is from, uh, I don't know how much it costs to do, uh, carry out a detailed building and safety assessment. Um, and whether that comes within the, the budget, I, I'm not sure. So is that where Mr. Chair, I, funds come through there? Mr Chair, I asked that before and I was given the commitment that that's out of the existing funding. And I, and I agree with, sorry, if I may, I agree with Councillor Melissa's comments. Mm. We need to fundamentally agree as a council. Mm. Um, so I, I as I a result of that, where, where we step to though. next? And yeah. this is a merry-go-round that I and others have witnessed for some time. So it should be, be the councillors consider the outcomes assessment one, such and such, um, when considering further budget allocations to the Jandera Woolshed or something. Well, well should that, you put uh, considering how we move forward? I, I don't know the, the envisaged um, future, future, because that's what we're talking about, getting that and, and coming back and yeah. and then going forward with a, okay. with, with what we think. Councillor Nancy looks like she's got some wording ready to go. Well, I'm just <laughs> suggesting that uh, we need to have some sort of understanding of how long this assessment's going to take because, mm, true. you know, if the assessment's going to take three or four months, that's going to take us past budget discussions Consideration, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I just wonder we need to consider that as well we, and we do need to consider um, some sort of operational expenses for or budget for them moving forward because the, you know whatever we decide if we shut it down we still have employees that have to be looked after and animals that have to be looked yeah, after and, and progressed in some fashion um, so there would have to be a certain amount of budget if we were to do that but if we were going to continue operating we you know what I'm saying? Oh, exactly. So may, maybe there's, there needs to be a, a uh, an opportunity for the board to digest this recommendation and come back to us in, in April with um, suggestions or costs or whatever it may be so we get a better idea. And in that time, we may well have an understanding of the cost and, and time frames to do a detailed building and safety assessment. And also it could be an interim budget could mm -hmm. be, yeah, could mm -hmm. be. So is that, Brian, you've been thinking really hard there. I've been hearing your cogs turning. Have you got anything more to add? 
recommendation C of, of part of 1C is that's mm -hmm. kind of the intention of that to carry out the comprehensive review of the future operations of that. So that would, I would think, pick up all of that. That was, I think, the intention so long as of that. Council <coughs> whether, you want to be more, whether you want to be more specific with that. So long as councillors were included in that wording. <laughs> well, I think we can add that. We can add you can put in, put in, you can put, put whatever you like in there, yeah. Participate in a comprehensive review. Yeah. The councils participate in a comprehensive review of options. Go, Wendy. Which includes a on-site visit or something. <coughs> you've, Look, you've actually got a question. Just yeah, I do. James? Okay. Thanks, Chair. Well, I'll go to Councillor O'Shea first, Councillor Carl, and I'll come back to you. Thanks, Chair. I just thought it would probably be a good opportunity to ask the manager of property services probably to say a few words because I think the like I think we all probably recognise the important part about this or trying to look at it simplistically first stage is if it's around the recommendation of closure is obviously that funding is put towards this asset audit if you want to call it that then the report comes back to council which would then formulate the next steps would that be the simple way of looking so you at you're stage? inviting uh, I, would like, I'd invite the I would I would like to yeah. either from Nick or Kent just around obviously all the conversation that we've had, because if it's property services that are going to undertake, undertake the works, yeah. Yeah, or contract it, whatever or, it may yeah, be. True. And uh, if, if, uh, if the manager of property services has any idea on perhaps uh, quantum of charge as he's walking forward here and time frames, that would be useful as well. Do you want to do another lap? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Jeff. Thanks for the question, Councillor James. I think at a minimum we're going to need lead time of about three to four months and uh, it's going to be a tender uh, over 200,000 so we're going to have to go to full market to get the asset condition reports that you refer to. Um, so we're going to need that lead time to do that um, and then we could uh, use that as the basis for information uh, for councillors to then have the discussions and I would suggest it's not just about uh, assets so we can get that done with the necessary safety engineering reports and so forth but there'd also be a um, complementary report done on provenance so that would then give us the indication as to the histor history of the buildings and whether or not they are part of the future mm. and where they've come from to get there and if they um, make up part of the, the future of the operations. Yeah, that's good. I agree that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, thanks, mm. uh, thanks, Kent. Kent, while you're there, sorry, Bill, can I just ask Kent one question while he's here? Um, and I know General Manager Anne Marie has been talking with, uh, with Nick and yourself. The $244,000 federal government drought uh, funding that was to be put towards and spent before June 30, yep. um, is that something that you think is achievable with the support of Council? To get that done in time? Uh, look, myself, uh, Emma and Paul Curry are working very hard to try and meet that deadline. Yep. So, okay. yep, we are doing what we can to... And it, it goes towards rectifying some of the issues that have been raised through the Workplace Health and Safety? That's right. There are some engineering reports that have been um, provided that that work would be based on, but the time frame to achieve it um, based on uh, market availability to do that works sure. will be the big issue. Sure. Yep. Okay. So that's another body of work that's being done at the same time. So, Councillor Carl. Yeah, Chair, I'm, I'm not altogether com comfortable as a councillor that I'm um, um, lumped into the basket of participating in a comprehensive review of operations. I don't think that's my role as a councillor. My role is to be for it to be reported to me, the outcomes of it, and those with the uh, technical skills and ability to be able to carry that, uh, carry out that assessment, happy to go and have a look at a few buildings, but I don't, I'm not comfortable with the words uh, participate in a comprehensive review of options. Uh, so you that, that you, you want, really want that softened review. from um, participate? Yeah, I, I think our role is to... What about is workshop? To, is to, Part of a workshop? Yeah. Whatever. I think our role as a board, as councillors, is to have some strategic oversight about these are the facts. Is this um, uh, sustainable moving forward into the future? What's in, what's out? Distill all that and then make a decision in the interests of the public 
and so the public does that, notice. Just, does that wording there satisfy you then? That councillors workshop a comprehensive review of options? Yeah. Which is the same intent I think the Councillor Summerfield was yeah, I, I, I just wanted to draw the divide clearly no, in, no, a, in a re recommendation between an operational function and a, yeah. a councillor's role in yeah. reviewing that. That's all. So just uh, prosecuting, given the CEO's comments before and Councillor Summerfield rightly picked up on it in regard to the ongoing operation, I think you call it residual or whatever it might have been, um, CEO, 2B and 2B, we've got 2B or not to be, 2 2Bs actually. Um, are you saying that 2BB actually is combined as one 2A? <laughs> or is there, should there be a 2A and a 2B? We've got two, two Bs up there. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're, you're working it through. Oh, you're both working that through. Oh, we are. Right. -o. Well, we're happy with, with recommendation one. Okay, one C has become two. The council's workshop and comprehensive. B reallocate as much of the general. That wording just doesn't sound. No, right it to doesn't. Me. No. It reallocate doesn't. as much of the the annual general woolshed as possible. That's one C. That's. Does that even need to be there? Well, what it does is put the spotlight on a budget process that after the top two have been done, then through a budget process, you can determine. But I don't know about as much. As, as, as necessary to project manage the minimum required, because we're not talking about maintenance yet. We're actually just talking about keeping, keeping animals fed. Yep. And so it's operational as much as necessary of the budget to project, manage, no, sorry, to relocate as much as required, wouldn't you? Brian's working through it here. Yeah, here we go. So to relocate as much as necessary of the annual JWB as, pos as necessary, as, as necessary, yeah, required, necessary, to it's already at the start of it, so I don't need it after it. But okay, as much maintain operational works. Do you? Of the annual budget and required to maintain. All we're saying is that we just want the animals fed. Yeah, yeah that's all. That's right, and that's what. And you know, yeah. but, but we but also we do that's require. What actually, that's what I thought it said there, because it's oh. saying it's saying that yeah, your preferred position is to that reallocate as much. What was the one I had before? Yeah, this has gone the other way, You've but gone, it's reflecting the same outcome. It, it isn't because you actually have to consult with the board to see how much they need operationally. Yeah. Yeah. And this, the way that was structured there was to say, any money that's not needed um, for operational works gets reallocated for maintenance works. So that was the, that was the intention <coughs> of that C. What was that one I had there? Yeah, which is that D, which is D, written there, D now. So it was reallocate as much. So council's preferred position is to reallocate as much of the annual John Darien budget as possible to council's property services branch to project, to project manage the required maintenance works as possible, whatever. Yeah, so it's you not- You don't do that until you've actually, you have to work with the board and they say they'll need some money for, you know, to make sure the stock's fed yeah. and the places, you know. That's right. So it's just as much as possible. That's your intention and it's flagged through yeah. recommendation one. That's the way it was structured. I think you're just suggesting doing it the other way around, but you can, you can do it either way. Yeah. So just to clarify, there is a budget required to carry out 1A. And Kent just mentioned that that Good. will go out to tender. So there is no, currently we don't have a budget for that body currently of there's works. no budget to go out to tender. And it was a couple of hundred thousand dollars, I thought, yeah. minimum, he was talking through. So between now and next week, perhaps that needs to be uh, considered as to how that could be funded through the organisation uh, in C some way. Point of um, uh, clarity on that um, through you, Chair. Have we, 
isn't this pretty well trod and crowned? Haven't we actually had a, um, a member of council do a workplace assessment and a building assessment and that was done over, I don't know, the 10 months or something and that <coughs> led to the however many recommendations? Yeah, 400 items. So there is that work. I don't know. The, the provenance element of it, I don't think, has ever been tested. Uh, Ken Stooley? Ken, Ken Stooley. Uh, but there certainly was a report around the health and safety elements of it, specific, and that's been worked through. That's the 400 items. But as far as you know, buildings, whether they should or shouldn't be there, and all those Eight. sorts of things, I, I don't think they're there. Ken, did you want to add any more to that? Oh, no, you that's, that's, that's pretty it. much it. Yeah. Councillor Carl. Yeah. I go back to my question to the general manager, acting general manager Anne Marie. I asked the question: Would the the expenses for this audit come out of John Derry and Woolshed's normal budget? And the answer was yes. So we're talking about an additional two hundred thousand. So the current help? annual budget for the John Derry and Woolshed. So that's the 2020, 2020 to. 2021 budget um, at a request um, has been forwarded for additional yep. funds for, for just um, general operations to carry them through to the 30th of June, so an additional $100,000 plus additional human resources. So there isn't any capacity within the John Darwin Woolshed's existing budget to carry out this work, so that will have to be carried out by um, Council. Councillors, we've got a recommendation there before us. Um, it's, it's slightly different to what um, the officer presented to us, um, but the reasons being that councillors need to be informed, as I understand it, through the, the process. Um, are councillors comfortable with 1A, B, C and D? Keeping in mind that we've got the ordinary meeting next week where we can re-prosecute this if there's more information comes to light. Uh, item number two. You're right, Ron, you want to add something to it? Or suggest something? The right, if, you, if you're looking at A, B, C, D, A, uh, A, B, C, D, B doesn't, if you read the introduction in uh, one, then read that and run that into para two, uh, to B. It says that the board of the John Darren Woolshed be advised that council's preferred position is to temporarily close community access to the John Darren, John Darren Woolshed facilities to that councils consider the outcomes of assessment one mm. A above. Mm. Doesn't it's it's not a recommendation in a form that you could actually use. Well, maybe it should be a separate item. Mm. It it should really be a separate item as number two perhaps. Um, and you can use it then as number two. The council consider the outcomes of the assessment in 1A above. Yeah, the council consider the assessment 1A above. What about that should see then um, uh, and be included in a workshop so you combine two and three? and be included in a workshop. Um, to consider a comprehensive review of the... Yeah, that's got to it. To consider a comprehensive... We've got two considers in there. Well, that's okay. Give, give them both, see what happens. It can change. To consider... Uh, a comprehensive review of operations. So just um, one B there, that they, to re reallocate the John Darren Woolshed budget. That was, that recommendation was in there if the operations were closing and the 691,000 was available. Yeah. But if the um, facility remains open, the budget would not be available. That's right. So, so we do need some funds yeah. there. And this is where a conversation, I think, with the board, that's where I go back to. Maybe the board needs to digest this and perhaps be 
in the April meeting. Um, to answer questions. To ask questions and look, let's face it, the board, they, they actually are passionate about this as well, right? As the volunteers, all of those people. So I think this is a, a, a big decision we can work through with them. I think we, give, we need to give them some respect that they actually came to us through a deputation for X, Y, Z. We've given them A as an option and perhaps there's a chance to, in April, start this process. Councillor Vonhoff. Thank you, Mr Chair. And to that end, if we, if we were not showing respect to the board, um, the subsequent motion there that council consult with the board of John Derry and Woolshed to reach agreement on and the several points, if we weren't showing respect to them, then that would have read that council inform the board. In fact, as we've worded it, shows the respect that we have for the board and and, and I'll leave it at that. No, I'm not disagreeing. I'm not, not disagreeing at all. So we've worked through 1A, B, C. The, the B is still in highlighted blue for some reason. Is that because we're not happy with that? Yes. OK. And then we go to, um, and this is where, and the potential to reallocate annual budget, Drenera and Woolshed, uh, to property services, to project manage. Is that contradictory to 1C? I think if we're coming back to council with a, a detailed report, I don't think 1C is that. probably not required now. You don't need 2B. You don't need 2B. No, that's, that's what I would have 1B. 1B, I don't think you need, you because need that covers off <laughs> in 2 well, 2B, doesn't it? Is that, should, should that be 2A, not 2B? Or is there no C? Oh, yeah. You're going to fix that up when we're finished. OK. Uh, <coughs> councillors can see the outcomes of such and such and the potential reallocate funds. Well, that's, that seems to be where we've landed. OK. Is there a 2... Anything else after 2A, B or C? Or is there just 2B, which becomes 2? Is there a B under 2B? Or is there just, just go down, wouldn't you? Is there, okay, so two, that two above it should just be, the outcome, what, what have we got there? That council's considered the outcome. What's the B mean? <laughs> it's because. Right, it's, it's not there, good, it's gone. Uh, three. Council consult with the board. Well, that's. I don't think anyone's. Anyone got an issue with that one? Three A B C D. So, I did wonder um, how that works in with one, uh, or is it two? The one above it. Two. The council is going to consider the outcomes of the assessment, and that's what will dictate how long it's closed for. Yeah, I think three and two almost happen together, don't they? Yeah. Maybe the, that councillors and the board consider the outcome. Yeah, the councillors and the board consider. Yeah. And you've nearly got it covered then, haven't you? Yeah. For, um, yeah, and those items under it will actually be outcomes of two. So keeping it the same is probably, keeping it like that's probably okay. Yeah. Question. Councillor Carl, question? Yeah, just a question about that. Is that uh, inferring that councillors and the board will be uh, uh, in a discussion together or I would see it important for councillors to be able to have open and robust conversation about the strategic direction of this, or for that matter, any other item of or part of council, aside from uh, board members of third parties, we don't actually have a joint discussion with Tisby or the um, or the Empire Theatre. Um, is is it joint discussion, or is it that they, they make their recommendations to us about the future directions? future operations? Yeah, I, I don't know. In an, in an idea, well, that'll probably happen out of it, but there could be a, a discussion 
in an initial stage, a workshop that includes both so that we can work through ideas. So I think what you've said is correct. There could be a, a divergence of views between a Woolshed Board and a Council and that's why it would be it would be a council decision down the track to do that. So I don't think I don't think there's anything wrong with number two in regard to considering um, the assessment and, and workshop, which would mean an on-site, and I agree, you know, an on-site visit's imperative um, sooner rather than later. But I think that covers all of that, um, Councillor Carl. I think it'd go to that next step. So number three, can we just drag down the screen, please, Wendy? A bit further. I think we're comfortable with three, and then four. It's four. I want to review the effect of the closure arrangements and the need for additional funding rather than to provide it by council in the 2021 financial year. Has four already been covered off? In I think it's. I think it's area. covered in the above ones. To be yeah. honest. I think five, five still stands. Oh well, it's four now. Sorry, five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Five. So it's four, four and five almost together. No, separate. And can I just fix my grammar, please? Unattributed sure. is awful. Can we just say not attributed? In four. Uh, okay, it not attributed, unattributed. Yeah. <laughs> unattributed. <laughs> it was late. <laughs> right. Okay, we're comfortable with four. Number five. Chair, can I ask a question? Question. Sorry, Councillor McMahon. Thanks. I oh, know. I'm just looking at number six. Oh, okay. Um, Is, we're happy with five. Okay, Tim, number just six. Just question to Councillor Vonoff. I would have vote on that. I just wonder if it's really necessary. Do we really need to, one department of council, write a letter to another department, give them a kick up the backside? Like, I, I think they're doing a good, and I note the chairs on both John Darren and Order and Risk. Could it be, give them a copy of the results? Well, I don't. I don't know about. We got to remind ourselves. It's, so, their can I? Yeah, I'm happy to answer to the, answer that. Um, so, Councillor McMahon, the audit and risk committee isn't just council members. We we have no, members I, I of know, the public on there, and I also need to point out that when this issue was um, considered, the chair um, was of a differing opinion, um, but um, which w w provided me with some comfort, but. This, the Audit and Risk Committee, its its creation is legislated in the Local Government Act because we are considered a large council. And their job is, amongst other things, to monitor the integrity of financial documents and to make recommendations, this is legislated, to make recommendations to council about any matters that they consider need action and improvement. We rely on that because we have, we have duties and obligations under the Act as well, all of us. And if there are matters that come, come before them, they consider it and then they do not make a recommendation to Council, then that becomes a question for us councillors as to the degree of confidence we have in that Audit and Risk Committee. So this is a step before that saying, Audit and Risk Committee members, we would like to remind you of your responsibilities under the Local Government Act to re make recommendations to Council of those matters that you think require further investigation. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to leave it in there, Chair. I just was, was um, questioning its relevance, but thanks for the answer. No, that's fine. And item, anyone any comment on item number six? Item number seven. Just hand over to the CEO. Just in relation to number six, if I was on the audit committee, uh, I would want to know the context of that, of that um, reminder. 
So do you, do you want to think about... OK. In relation to the decision not to... I have to be careful with the words here. In relation to the decision of the committee not to make a re recommendation, a public recommendation, recommendation, referring a matter to the Triple C. A public recommendation because it's about it's about what is minuted and comes to council because that's what's auditable that's the official record that we rely on as councillors so um, I'll just make a comment there and just wonder how deep you go here because um, the general manager of finance and business was in that meeting and we've heard the actions that have been taken there and without the audit committee having knowledge uh, that the general manager of finance and business had I just wonder and during that meeting I'm, I'm reasonably confident that um, Anne-Marie you actually made comment of it and the action that was being taken uh, and therefore the audit uh, committee in my mind and Councillor Shine might recall something different uh, was comfortable with the action that council was taking given the um, I think your words Brian weren't allegations it was more uh, reference to the situation um, so Anne-Marie you want to just comment on that that you did make comment uh, in the audit committee and therefore the audit committee seemed comfortable with the action that was taken. Was yeah, that and I think at that point in time, the allegations had, were unsubstantiated. Um, Governance and Legal Services had asked for, for further details. The further details indicated lack of ability to substantiate the allegations that had, ma had been made. Now, that was the information. That I, yeah. I provided that at, at the, the audit, audit committee. At the audit committee, and therefore the audit committee had no reason, I would have assumed, to, to do anything further. Would that, that would be... And I also mentioned that governance and legal services had been in touch with the Triple C in relation to the, the matter raised. OK. So, um, Chair, I'll, I'll remind councillors of the role and the function of that Audit and Risk Committee, and that is that they provide a report back to us councillors and we've had con considerations, discussions last month about that's a three hour meeting and we get a one page, a one page report, is that sufficient? Remember, this is, these are the conversations that we had. And in that report that comes back to council, we have two representatives on the Audit and Risk Committee and then councillors are able to attend and at last week's there were several of us who attended that. But the official record of those meetings is what is in the minutes. What the report that come, the report that will come to council, I assume, next week. And that is the public record of the recommendations, the, the discussions and the recommendations that come to council. And for an audit and risk committee to to hear something and to say oh, it's being dealt with, it's up to councillors really. If you're, if you're comfortable that you don't need to know about it and if there's, there's further problems down the track and you're happy to go, oh well, I wasn't there and it wasn't in the report but I assume it was okay, so be it. I'm certainly not comfortable with that, certainly not comfortable with that. And I would actually argue that they are falling short of their responsibilities under the Act to make recommendations to council about any matters that they consider need action or improvement. And I guess what, what Anne-Marie has explained is that she actually spoke at the audit committee and outlined the process. and. I'd suggest to you that there would be other uh, triple C activities that take place in the organisation that councillors wouldn't be made aware of, nor the audit committee. 
and they go through a process and it sounds like this is the same. So the audit committee uh, heard what um, Anne-Marie said and they were obviously comfortable with that, that uh, process obviously. because it had already gone down that path. For them to then say, uh, we recommend council does this action when council's already doing that action, I just, I just don't know what else they, they should have done. Chair, with respect, it's about public transparency of those, those minutes and of the decisions. It's not, in my opinion, good enough to just be told, well, they made a decision. There needs to be a record of it, and the record falls back onto the Act, and that is that it is their responsibility to make recommendations to Council. And honestly, from a perspective, if I was sitting on an Audit and Risk Committee, I would want an official document that says we considered it and this was the recommendation that came out of that consideration. It's, it's not good enough in my opinion that we, there's a discussion and they say, okay, wheels are in motion, I'm comfortable with that. They still need to make recommendations to council because that's an official record and it leads to public transparency in, in governance. Yeah, CEO might just make a comment, then I'll go to Council Summerfield. I think you've got to be very careful about what you're putting on the public record in relation to complaints made at the Triple C. Um, it wouldn't be that transparent because you wouldn't be able to put any detail behind that information because you wouldn't want to um, disclose information that the Triple C may need to keep confidential until such time as it's done confidential investigations. And also, there's potential to um, raise uh, allegations that may involve people that are, and they are allegations at that point in time, and there's potential for defamation in relation to some of those issues if they're, if they're raised and there is no substance behind those. So you, you, the things that they would recommend to council, they would not be transparent uh, and should not be transparent to the public at that point in time until at such times it would have run its course through the investigation and advice of the, of the Triple C. So I don't think you're going to get transparency apart from raising a, an allegation that may or may not be substantiated and raise a whole lot of suspicion and create issues for, um, in this case, John Darian Woolshed board or, or employees. And, when, and that's the other thing. You, you, who, 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 or potentially, people are implicated here who may be totally innocent, but just by being either an employee or on the board, um, <coughs> I, I don't think you're you're achieving the objective that you're trying to achieve by doing that, because you'd have to maintain some confidentiality, um, because you can't go out and say those things for for defamation in, in one case, but also the triple C. Um, doesn't uh, t doesn't support you you providing public evidence that may they may use um, or would need to secure other evidence that could be destroyed in the interim. And I'm not saying in this case that's that's the case, but that's a, just a general comment. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, Councillor Summerfield. Thank you, and I fully understand the sensitivity of it, and and certainly in the meeting there weren't and there was no detail revealed from, from what I could see. But I just wanted to make the point that um, from those discussions that happened, the interactions that happened on that particular subject at that meeting, I still had no clue. And I think there were something like three emails ex uh, exchanged with, um, and I think you were included on those emails too, Brian, um, to clear up so that I had comfort in, in what had Process, you know, what process had been taken. Um, it's important that we do keep it de-identified. You've only got to look at what's happening currently in the federal sphere. It, it's judgment by social media and um, mm -hmm. and the media. Um, so I fully respect that, but I, I was left very confused from the discussions that were held at the Audit and Risk Committee meeting. So I, I think that maybe the, it's, it's more about the the minuting of of the audit committee, which was quite sparse last time they came to uh, to council, 
and uh, and we actually spoke about that at the meeting and uh, determined through each section uh, what would come through and I think you'll you'll see many more recommendations come through from the audit committee uh, in fact I think there was about well, it was close to half a dozen recommendations that were coming from the most recent audit committee because of that reason um, I just keep coming back to um, whether this recommendation in the context of where it sits and the circumstances around it wh whether it's um, the audit committee would say well we we heard the information um, all we would do is recommend that we do exactly what's being done. No, we don't know the details no, they didn't. of the context. They didn't make that recommendation, though. That's exactly my point. They didn't make that recommendation. They said it's 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 happening. That's good enough. So you're suggesting the recommendation from them should be that we heard of this and we, we're comfortable with the course of action the council's Correct. taking. Correct. Okay. Well, if that's that's so maybe maybe chair. You know that as as the representation representatives, um, you and Councillor Shine can have that conversation with them about the need, the importance of that. If if that is going to be, um, if that's going to provide some comfort, mm. but I think that they're just uh, there needs to be if the. If there's the desire to make a recommendation, the recommendation has to be made officially. Yeah, no, I, I get where you're coming from. Um, and Councillor Shine and myself are more than happy to talk particularly to the chair. So uh, perhaps the then if that's the case, if, if and, and I mean, if that is the case, that you will have that, you undertake to have that conversation, then the, we'll, we can um, strike out six well, I'll, well, I'll give guarantee that, we'll, that we both will do that, and Councillor Shine will certainly pick me up if I don't. Um, Councillor Carl? Yeah, question. Look, I have absolutely no clue what you're talking about this this meeting or whatever, but anyway. Um, um, it's the audit, I, I audit committee meeting. Yeah, yeah, but I, I don't even think I'm... By the sound, I must not have been here. Um, anyway. Actually, uh, you were at the last one. You were. At the you last were. one? Yeah. Is, the is that the meeting? Most recent course? one, only it last week. <laughs> you're up the back. You, uh, in fact, you contributed to the conversation. <laughs> oh, that's the meeting we're talking about. Okay. Yeah, that is the meeting. Anyway, so, <laughs> continue on. So, I, whilst I take the point of having the conversation, but I do understand that, that at least if it's in writing as a recommendation, it's it's a formal it's a formal trail that could be referred to later on. Councillor Rebecca, I don't know. I, I, I'm not unhappy with it being in there. Um, I'm, whatever this council feels. Well, perhaps then to soften it, that council... Um, Councillor reminds, reminds the audit committee of... Um, the importance of making recommendations to council about any matters that they consider need action or improvement. Full stop. Yeah, that's fine. Over that. Okay, so that's item. Sorry, Councillor Harris Sullivan, you. Um, say, I suppose it's um, and having been in that audit and risk committee as well, it was around. I guess maybe Councillor Von Hoff, it, it's around what they feel is reportable, isn't it? I think. <laughs> I, I just have to make sure that I use the right words here. So, but you know that audit and risk committee, we they we rely on them to be to be, have full and frank discussions and make um, sometimes difficult recommendations to council because we can't be, they can't be and we can't be worried about, um, about appearances and anything like that. We need, we need full and frank recommendations so that we can make good government, governance decisions and a decision to not put something in a paper trail isn't good enough. We need that paper trail so that we can we can clap our eyes on it on it. And if some of us were not able to be at that audit and risk committee meeting, we wouldn't have knowledge of it. Mm. And and what about five years from now? There's no record of that. 
This is just about like, record keeping and transparency of discussion on the important issues. I understand there are some that um, won't meet that threshold, but I think I think that um, others definitely do meet that threshold and need to be reported, recommended, minuted. Okay, so we're comfortable. Item number okay. six stays yeah, where like it is. It better now, thanks. You're comfortable. Councillor McMahon, you said that? Okay. And item number seven, which I think we've covered off on yep. a few times between now. Can we just go back to um, number one, Wendy? So, sorry, Mr Chair, can I just say that number six sorry. sounds a bit odd. Uh, council reminds its audit committee about any matters they consider need action or improvement. Yeah. Yep. Wouldn't we... I think that sounds really rather odd. I, 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 I don't think that responsibilities. I don't think that captures recommendation. What you're to. Thank, you. Recommendation. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. To recommend to council. Yes. The council reminds you to recommend to council, to council that recommends to council any matters. Yep. Is that a good pick up, Councillor Carr? Refers or recommends. You're comfortable with that? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Okay. No, that's OK. Yeah. You're happy with that? Remove OK, let's, can we go back up to item one? It's got to remove two. Two, remove two. OK, any matters that they consider? Happy with that? Thank yeah. you. Do recommend to council. Um, one A, carry out a detailed building and safety assessment, which will inform, which is fine. Um, through to you, Anne-Marie, uh, General Manager, Finance <coughs> and Business, and hearing what we've heard from Kent, does the wool shed have capacity, given they've requested for uh, $100,000 in one of their recommendations from the end of May to June, uh, does, it, does the wool shed have capacity to commence this work? No, it doesn't. And what I would like to suggest is that the work commences immediately and the budget's provided to property services at budget review too. Okay. So th that would be in line with council's wishes to actually get this thing happening, start afresh, whichever, whatever way you look at it. Yeah. So can you just give that wording to Wendy again, just slowly? Wendy, can you... Would that be C? Can you type this in? As C, please. Okay, Anne Marie, where are you go. So I think it probably goes before B, okay, before, before the B. reallocation, because we're talking about um, the funding being sourced from within the current year's um, council's budget. Okay. So that and um, the funds necessary to carry out the works. Just um, slowly, slowly. That funds necessary sorry. to carry out the works in A. The works. Or carry out the detailed building and safety assessment. Be approved and and brought to account at budget review too. Okay. Right. <coughs> so we, I do need an estimate from Kent. So Kent did mention okay. that that would be in excess of two hundred thousand dollars. <coughs> You add and after steps that it, that'll allow that to flow on then? Yeah, well, that's the, that was just exactly the words I was going to say, uh, Councillor Summerfield. It's almost like it's a separate motion. No, I could go there, but just add and after standard. So, yeah, at 1A, at the end of standard, add and, reallocate. No, that's not the wording. No, we, can, um, we can't reallocate any of the Jandarian Woolshed And that budget. funds, so just change, take that up to there. Makes it a long. Paragraph, that's okay. And that, yeah. that covers it. Yep. It's a very long paragraph, but that works. Okay. Anne Marie, does that cover yeah. off on where you said? Just ask a, Kent, Kent, is he happy with that? 1A, one 1B, one so 2. 2 gets deleted, Wendy. You've already got it up there as 1A. Mm -hmm. I think um, 1B is probably um, premature. That was in the event of closing the facility immediately and not providing the operating budget to the woolshed. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know what 1B is until we've done 1A, do we? That's correct. 
we are closing it. Yeah. One A. To carry out a detailed building and safety safety assessment, which will inform council funding it required to bring the facility to a safe number and that funds necessary to carry out the detailed building assessment will be approved and brought to budget, brought to account over. Nick, you seem to be excited about coming down the road. Can I, Mr Chair? Yeah, go first. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair, just in relation to the Funding item that we, the, the funding matter that we're talking about, I think that should be a separate, a separate number. So it should be become two or three or four or whatever, one. because item one is about advising the board of our preferred position, and the way we fund that is for us to determine. Okay, so Wendy, you were right before, so put it as two. You're well in front of the game. <coughs> so. <laughs> Okay, so therefore, two a yeah right, eh? We're happy enough with that. Reads okay. If there's only one option. Do you need to put a there? <laughs> well, <laughs> you can almost have facilities to carry out a detailed, and just take like out we're that. We're going around the bush here, fair thing. Yeah. It would be an Hang in there, time. you're starting to get hungry. <laughs> Come on, Tim. stick with us. All righty. As I said, there's <laughs> one option, we don't need something. So, Councillor McMahon, you're happy with that top one now? Hang on, I haven't read it. Right. I'm happy to move, Mr Chair. Okay, we've got a mover, we've got a second. Moved by Councillor Vonhoff, seconded by Councillor Summerfield. We've got the motion there before us. I don't propose to read it out. I think we've we've pretty well done it. 27 times. Several times. Is there anyone who uh, wishes to speak against the motion? Too okay. Uh, Councillor Vonhoff, would you like to <laughs> say anything or would you like, happy to go to the vote? I'll just say this is, it's public money and we have a responsibility to have a pretty tight handle on that and have an, a, a venue that is open to the public. Uh, thank you. Councillors, before we go to the vote, I just wanted to thank you for your consideration here. It's been a long but very important discussion and uh, I think Councillor Summerfield summed it up pretty well before um, that we need to work with uh, uh, towards a, a fresh beginning in some cases. So. That being said, the motion there is before you. Those in favour? Motion is carried. Um, Councillor Carl was outside of the room at the time. Um, when he, as long as we've recorded that, um, it's unanimous, other than the fact that we didn't have someone in the room. Councillors, um, that actually concludes the open part of of uh, finance and business. Uh, I propose that we uh, adjourn the meeting for uh, until 2pm uh, where we go directly to Environment and Community Committee uh, with the Mayor. Um, yeah, economic development. After economic development, there's nothing coming forward. So if we can just deal with that now, just to note that. I'm okay, would you like to open open the meeting and close it? This is this is a move to adjourn move to adjourn the finance and business. Yeah, moved by Councillor um, Carroll and Councillor um, O'Shea. Those in favour? Okay, hand over to you now. Uh, just open the meeting. Uh, I guess we need a motion for that. Do we open the uh, economic no, development? You just you can just Carol. open it. You, don't. You, you you can just open it. Yeah. Open it, and um, there are no matters coming forward. Move that we adjourn the meeting. Is there a, do we need a move? No, not really. You just close your meeting. Close and we're, meeting. we're back close. at two, back at two o'clock. Resume at two o'clock for right Councillor right. O'Shea.
Uh, thank you. Welcome back to those uh, many hundreds that are watching online. <laughs> we appreciate your attendance and hanging in there with us. Our first item coming out of closed is item number six, uh, quote or tender consideration plan for power purchase agreement for the new energy generation project. The recommendation is there before us. Somewhere, there it is. The Council prepare a quote or tender consideration plan for the purchase of power at the Crestbrook Dam 2, Perseverance and Kirby Dam pumping stations without first seeking quotes or tenders under section 230 of Local Government Regulation 2012. We have a mover. Moved by Councillor Megan. Seconder. Seconded by Councillor Shine. Uh, those in favour? Carried unanimously. Got that one, Wendy? Right, clear. Next one, uh, councillors, is item seven, uh, which is the Southern Queensland Inland and New South Wales Border Regional Water Alliance. Now we have an alternate uh, recommendation. Alternate recommendation, Councillor Von Hoff. Yeah, would you like to read that? Yep, that Council advised the Southern Queensland Inland and New South Wales Border Alliance of its support for the original intent of the group, namely collaboration of local governments with the aim of advocating long-term water security for the greater region. Thanks, Can Councillor Von Hoff. Uh, Mr Chair, Question. is that word on the screen there original or in initial? No, it's supposed to be original or initial. It means it makes no difference. Same. Same thing. It's but virtually the same uh, yeah. word, but anyway, well, you have now that's been changed by one yeah. word. Councillor Von Hoff, you have it. Do I have a seconder for Councillor Von Hoff's motion? Seconded by Councillor Summerfield. Um, those in favour of this motion? Uh, when do we, do we have to record these because it's an alternate motion? No. Um, motion. Uh, those against? Motion's lost. Uh, we then go to the. Alternate recommendation number two. Thank you, Wendy. You're doing a great job here. Um, under trying circumstances. The alternate recommendation number one, the council authorised the chief executive officer to take the necessary steps to enable council to become one of the initial members of a company to access external funding and be structured as a company limited by guarantee to formalise its role in the proposed Southern Queensland Inland and New South Wales Border Regional Alliance. And number two, that Council endorse the Mayor Councillor RP Antonio to be one of the initial directors of the company limited by guarantee to collaborate and represent the interests of Council. That's the alternate recommendation. Sorry, is this an amendment or a recommendation? No, it's the alternative. That's, that's, the, that's the motion. Uh, just uh, just a matter of English, could we put the word with after collaborate? Yes, good. Mm. To collaborate with yeah. and represent. Uh, okay. We have a mover of that motion. Moved by Councillor Carl. Seconder. Seconded by Councillor seconder. Carol Taylor. Those in favour of that motion? Those against? The motion is carried uh, by majority. Uh, we're done. Thank you, Councillor.